and everyone to keep yourselves muted throughout the duration of the workshop. If at any point you have any questions for our guest speakers, please put your questions in the chat and we will get to them at the end of each session. And just to give a quick overview of today's agenda, we'll first hear from Stefan Gildemeister from the Minnesota Department of Health, who will be giving just a general overview of the workshop today and what session objectives and topics will be covered. Um, we'll then hear from Pamela Mink from the Minnesota Department of Health, who will be giving an overview of Minnesota's study on telehealth expansion and payment parity. After that session, we'll hear from Julia Harris from the Bipartisan Policy Center, who will give an overview of the current federal telehealth policy landscape. And then we will have a 15 minute break before diving into our policy informed telehealth research panel, which will feature three panelists. So we have Ativ Marotra from Harvard University, Annette Todden from the Oregon Health and Science University, and Gianni Yu from Weill Cornell Medical College. And the panel will be moderated by Jean Abraham from the University of Minnesota. After this panel, we'll hear from Alana Knudsen from NORC at the University of Chicago, who will give an overview of the Maryland Healthcare Commission's telehealth legislative study. And then lastly, we'll hear from Jonathan Neufeld at the Great Plains Telehealth Resource and Assistance Center, who will provide some closing remarks. So I will now pass it over to Stefan at the Minnesota Department of Health, who will introduce himself and his team and then give a general overview of the workshop today and what session objectives and topics will be covered. Thanks, Amelia. Um, let me see, you can hear me and you can see me? Yep. Excellent, good. Um, good afternoon, everyone. And everyone, I'm so pleased to see so many people from across the country who are tuning into this workshop. Uh, I'm also particularly pleased by the panel of experts who were able to join us today and, and from whom we're, we'll be hearing in a minute. Um, as Amelia said, my name is Stefan Gildemeister. I direct the Health Economics Program here at the Minnesota Department of Health, and my job today is to introduce the team here at MDH and some of our partners and then kick off the workshop. So without further ado, joining me today, in addition to the team from Oregon are, and, and the presenters are Dr. Pam Mink, who is the co-PI in the study, um, and she will introduce herself in a moment when she um, uh, provides an overview of the study. Kristen Agert, who is the policy coordinator for the Health Economics Program, and Kelsey Schanzer, who manages our communication activities. We're also joined by members of the technical advisory group to this legislative study and uh, colleagues from the Minnesota Department of Human Services, the agency uh, that administers Medicaid in the state who are conducting uh, a parallel study in the public program space. So uh, maybe a couple of words on what brought us to convening this workshop today. It certainly was the legislative study on the impact of telehealth here in Minnesota uh, that we were directed to conduct and that we're in the kind of in the midst uh, of, of uh, uh, working on. But ultimately, what brought us here was the realization that uh, telehealth represents a promise for access, for improved access to healthcare services for some and in some areas, but that it also really has the potential to reshape care delivery uh, and the system of care delivery in really substantial ways. And yet that the evidence and the field of telehealth practice and research is really evolving and, and changing. So um, we were looking for an opportunity to learn uh, from and discuss with others about the, the existing best practices uh, and recommendations for conducting research to, to better understand the impact of telehealth on issues like access to healthcare, uh, healthcare quality outcomes, costs, and equity. So we, in this workshop, we want to consider questions related to methodological challenges in this field of research and how to approach those challenges. What types of data and study designs could best produce timely uh, and relevant information for policymakers ultimately, how researchers uh, can approach uh, answering some of these pressing questions and, and questions that we haven't even queued up yet. 
and what some potential blind spots are in research or in the research community that may not directly translate uh, into real world impacts uh, and telehealth policy. So we look forward to the information and the insight to be shared today. And, and, and we know that the federal government and states continue to grapple with questions around how to pay for telehealth and where telehealth um, can have a positive impact on uh, care providers and the system people. Um, and, and we're excited that that so many of you are joining us. So, so uh, Amelia said already a little bit about the agenda. I'll just maybe just summarize again, sort of how we've structured the approach. Uh, we'll hear uh, first about telehealth, current telehealth policies and the legislative study that we're working on in Minnesota. We'll, we'll then get a refresher on the landscape um, of federal and state uh, uh, telehealth policies. Then we'll listen to a panel of experts answering pressing questions uh, about how to evaluate telehealth and what we need to think about moving forward. We'll have a team of researchers who is, who's done some work um, in on a Maryland legislative study. And then we'll close the workshop with um, comments and questions for all of us to consider in our in our upcoming work. So with that, um, I'll, I'll pass it back on to you, Amelia, to take us uh, further along the, the workshop. And again, I'm so pleased that so many of you are here to, to help us uh, learn about telehealth research and, and how to inform policy development, even as the field is evolving around us. Great, thank you so much, Stefan. So we will kick things off by hearing from Pam Mink at the Minnesota Department of Health regarding Minnesota's telehealth study. Pam Mink is Director of Health Services Research in the Health Economics Program at the Minnesota Department of Health. In her current position, she leads a research team that works primarily with healthcare claims data in the Minnesota All-Payer Claims Database. Recent projects cover a broad range of topics, including telehealth, healthcare utilization and spending, opioid prescribing patterns, and prevalence and spending for chronic conditions. She earned her MPH and PhD in epidemiology at the University of Minnesota and has worked in applied research settings both government and private sector for over 20 years. So Pam, I will hand things over to you. Great, thanks Amelia. And uh, just let me know if my voice fades out or I'm too loud or anything like that. Um, next slide, please. So I'm gonna give an overview of the, the Minnesota telehealth study, which um, was, is a legislatively directed study written in Minnesota statute. So I'll give a little history of what Minnesota's specific tele telehealth policy has been, um, the questions uh, that we have been asked to address by the legislature through, through this study, um, what the various components of the study are so far and how we're approaching some of these questions and then kind of where we are and what's coming next. Um, next slide, please. Um, so this kind of shows the timeline and I will talk about um, the, uh, the first three boxes in, in a little bit more detail and then finish up with telling you where we are with um, the reports that will be shared, not just with the legislature, but also be made available publicly. Next. So the Minnesota Telemedicine Act um, was, was uh, written into law in 2015. And um, I'm giving this mostly a sort of background as to kind of what the foundation was and where we where things took off um, with the onset of COVID. So prior to the onset of COVID with this act, um, one of the main components of this legislation was that uh, insurers, um, both for Medicaid and for commercial insurance, insurers that they reimburse telehealth visits at parity in the same way as in-person visits. During the, for this particular law, the Telemedicine Act, audio only was not considered to be a type of telemedicine, and so it was not um, subject to the parity laws. Um, on the left, I've summarized some of the things that apply to Minnesota healthcare programs. So those include 
medical assistance, which is the state's Medicaid program, as well as Minnesota Care, which is Minnesota's basic health plan. Um, so the, the act, and I haven't enumerated everything it covers here, but it, it covered for, for um, Minnesota healthcare programs, both the managed care and fee-for-service programs. There were some rules and guidelines about who can provide telehealth and who can receive telehealth, where they're located, um, and, uh, and, and the fact that they need to be an established patient. On the commercial side, um, it covered uh, synchronous or, or uh, real-time telemedicine as well as store and, store and forward, but in this 2015 um, legislation, remote patient monitoring was not covered. There were no restrictions on the commercial side for originating site. Um, and then there was also a, a component of it that uh, uh, said that patients can't be charged a greater deductible or copay for telehealth beyond what would have been charged for in-person. Next slide. So then along came um, the pandemic, or the, at least the first part of the pandemic. And, and one of the things that happened um, on the state level as well as on the federal level is a lot of, um, uh, a lot of the provisions around providing and, and receiving care through telehealth got sort of opened up and loosened up, especially um, to, to pick up some of the burden when clinics were closed or reduced hours or limiting the numbers of patients they could see in person. So there were, there were executive orders um, that really sort of opened up the things about where can the originating site be? What about out-of-state licensing? Um, audio only came into play as, as a, a covered um, way of, of delivering and receiving telehealth. Um, allowing providers to treat new patients um, via audio only. On the commercial side, um, really the same things basically applied um, as well as like expanding coverage to additional um, specialty or therapeutic areas. Um, and, and during part of, of, of the telehealth emergency, there was a wavering of, of cost sharing for certain types of visits. Next slide. So the Minnesota Telehealth Act of 2021 really set about to kind of codify some of those things that came about during the early stages of the pandemic. So expanding telehealth in terms of who can provide it, who can receive it, so the stipulations around that. Extended payment parity to include telephone only visits. Um, this provision has a sunset in June of 2024 um, that will need to be revisited to decide whether that should be continued or or not. Um, and then a big part of the legislation for us is it directed us to conduct a study um, to, to evaluate the impact of these policies. For the Minnesota Department of Health, we're asked to do that for um, people covered by private insurance or, or commercial health insurance plans. There's a parallel study with all the same questions um, that the legislature is interested in being led by Minnesota's Department of Human Services, and they're focusing on the populations they serve, so those covered by Medicaid or Minnesota Care. And there's a link here uh, if you want to read the whole, all the law. It's 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 long, um, and there's even a long list of of questions uh, that we're being asked to address. Next slide, please. So I tried to summarize that long list of questions as best I can here. And um, Stefan alluded to some of the main um, uh, points of interest by the legislature. So we've been asked to evaluate the impact of telehealth expansion and payment parity uh, for commercial insurance on the impact on access to healthcare services, quality of care, health outcomes, patient satisfaction, uh, how it fits into value-based payments um, and, and innovations in healthcare delivery. Um, we're also asked to, uh, to study the impact on healthcare disparities and equitable access to healthcare um, for underserved communities, um, the impact of, of these provisions in the law on healthcare costs and premiums, and also the impact on access to an avail availability of in-person care including specialty care, particularly in rural areas. Um, next slide. There are more questions uh, also to look at, uh, for, for us to look at the extent to which telehealth delivered services are substituting for or are in addition to in-person services, the extent to which they um, end up being duplicative of in-person services. Uh, also asked to look at for what types of services or what populations 
Um, does access to health, telehealth either improve or have a negative impact on health outcomes? Um, a lot of questions uh, uh, or a big part of the questions is on audio only communication, um, whether this should be continued, whether um, to what extent it does eliminate barriers to care without reducing quality, without worsening outcomes or without decreasing satisfaction. And then finally, how, how um, commercial payers ensure that telehealth services are appropriate to the patient needs and remain optional and, and, and don't become the only, the only way that um, uh, certain patients can receive certain types of care. Next, que uh, next question, next slide. So it's a lot, it's a big, we're, we're asked um, to answer a lot of questions um, and we're approaching it um, from a number of different angles. So, uh, to a large extent, we're looking to learn from research, the, you know, the research community, what research studies have been done, um, and also um, in engaging with uh, the Center for Evidence-Based Policy to, to do a really focused review on audio-only telehealth. Um, we're, we're interested in learning from other states and, and what, they, what, what they have learned, um, and also to just have a good understanding of the telehealth landscape in Minnesota, who's using it, who's providing it, for what types of services, how has that changed, is it continuing to change? Um, we have embarked with um, uh, Wilder Research, a, a local um, research firm to, who really specializes in qualitative research. Um, and they conducted a series of interviews with Minnesota patients, providers, and payers. Um, also, we may in the future do some additional sort of surveys or key informant interviews or discussions. For the quantitative part of this study, we have, um, as, as Amelia mentioned in my introduction, we have the Minnesota All Payer Claims Database. So we have access to healthcare claims data. And we also, um, through partnerships with other researchers, um, potentially have access to um, uh, clinical information from electronic health records. Uh, we're, we're talking to an actuarial firm to evaluate the impact on premiums. Um, and there are a number of existing surveys that the Minnesota Department of Health puts out of, of Minnesota residents, of, of um, providers, of clinics. Um, so making use of those and, and adding some telehealth questions where possible. We have a technical advisory group that Stefan mentioned um, to provide sort of input and insight on all aspects of this study um, through along the way. Uh, we have the workshop here today where we're really looking forward to listening and learning about um, uh, really to sort of guide the next phase of the study. And then we'll continue to have stakeholder engagement throughout. Next slide. So what have we learned so far? Um, the, the wilder research part of the study, the qualitative part has been completed. And I summarize just some of the high level findings here. Um, so, so in talking to Minnesota residents and providers and payers, um, people did talk about how telehealth um, and having telehealth available to them um, in 2020 and, and beyond has increased access to care. Um, it, it allows for more flexibility of, of when they can schedule appointments, uh, reduces waiting times um, or the time you have to wait to actually have a visit. Um, it makes a whole visit process take less time because you don't have to factor in transportation. Uh, it eased those transportation and child care challenges. Um, and it reduced, especially during um, the peak um, waves of COVID, it reduced any risks associated with going into the clinic or into the hospital for in-person care. Um, we heard from, from participants in the survey that, that they felt that telehealth visits were well suited to several types of routine care, including managing chronic illness, managing medications, um, providing mental health care, um, follow-up care, uh, such as after a procedure or hospitalization, um, and, and particularly useful with established patients. Um, perspectives on how do we pay for this um, or how much should we pay for this varied. Um, patients generally talked about appreciating that telehealth was an affordable option available to them. Um, providers emphasized um, that they felt reimbursement should be based on the level of service and the expertise of the 
clinician, and so it made sense for it to be the same as what they were providing in person. And payers expressed that they would be interested in a more flexible approach, um, not a mandated parity, but to give them options and, 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 and the ability to work with providers to come up with a, um, what they would consider to be um, appropriate reimbursement for telehealth services. Next slide. Um, we also learned from some of these other data sources between the Minnesota APCD and some of the surv uh, surveys, um, information that I think is, is really consistent with what's been seen on a national level and in other states. So telehealth in, uh, use has increased dramatically um, in 2020. It's leveled off to some degree, but still much higher than, than pre-2020. Um, Telehealth was really um, used a lot for delivering mental and behavioral health services, and those are still um, uh, are, are a large a large proportion of, of mental and behavioral health care services are still being delivered through telehealth. Um, and satisfaction has been high for telehealth and, and similar for audio only and video. We did find that um, black, indigenous and people of color. Um, residents of Minnesota were somewhat less satisfied than white Minnesotans, but it was a difference of about 70% saying that they would do a telehealth visit again versus 80% um, of, of white Minnesotans saying they do visit again. So there are a lot of questions that still remain. Um, I won't uh, I won't read this whole list here. It's, it's really kind of another version of, of a lot of the questions that were posed in the legislation. Um, but I think going forward into this next year, we really do want to um, focus um, more intentionally on, on questions of quality, questions of outcomes, ensuring equity, um, and really, you know, understanding if there are certain types of uh, telehealth for certain types of service um, that it's especially well suited for or, or patient populations um, that, that do especially well with, with telehealth or um, especially not well. Next, uh, next slide. Um, so how are we approaching this? Um, the, the main focus really in this next year, in addition to kind of filling in some of the gaps from the qualitative work, is to focus on the quantitative side of things. So the actuarial analysis that I mentioned, looking at um, what we can learn from data from electronic health records, looking at what we can learn from the all-payer claims database and any additional surveys and follow-up. Um, and really, uh, you know, looking forward to learning from this workshop any, you know, special uh, recommendations and any special cautions, um, uh, any any input at all is, is really what we're here to learn. Um, we have a preliminary report to the legislature um, that's coming out um, uh, sometime in the next month or two, and that will summarize the, the findings from the qualitative study. Um, and as well as what we've learned from some of the other data sources to date. And then our final report is due in early 2024. So stay tuned. Um, we do have a website. I forgot to put the link on here, but we can put that in the chat or share it with you otherwise. So you can keep track um, of, of what's happening with the study through the website. Um, and I believe there's also an email address there if you want to sign up for updates. So I think that's my last slide. And I don't think I left much time for questions, but. Uh, but happy to take any questions. And if, if we don't have time for them now, um, feel free to email me um, or to reach out through the website and, and happy to happy to talk to you further. Great, thank you so much, Pam. Uh, it was really helpful to get that overview of the Minnesota telehealth study and see what you've learned so far and what is ahead. Um, so thank you so much. And we will now zoom out a bit and shift into the policy overview session. So today we have Julia Harris from the Bipartisan Policy Center, who will be giving an overview of the federal telehealth policy landscape. Julia Harris is an associate director for the health program at the Bipartisan Policy Center. Prior to joining BPC, Harris was the director of clinical models for United Healthcare's Medicaid managed care business. For six years, she worked for TenCare, Tennessee's Medicaid program, leading value based payment and delivery system reforms, including developing a novel statewide health home program for members with severe and persistent mental illness. Harris joined the state of Tennessee after holding previous positions with the Kaiser Family Foundation in Washington, D.C and a large federally qualified health center in New Jersey, where she led a team of migrant and community health outreach workers. 
In 2017, Harris was part of a small team that took top prize in the global Qualcomm Tricorder X Prize competition to build an innovative consumer medical device. And Harris completed a Master of Public Health and a Master of International Affairs at Columbia University in 2011 and holds a bachelor's degree from Cornell University in Human Development. She is an associate member of the National Academy of Social Insurance. So, Julia, I will hand things over to you. Thanks. Uh, thank you for having me. That was a very thorough <laughs> intro. Sorry. <laughs> um, well, uh, very glad to be speaking to you all today. Um, I do think getting telehealth policy right is so important uh, at this moment. So I'm very happy to have been asked to talk about some of the federal telehealth policy changes that were made and go through some of the work of the Bipartisan Policy Center. So uh, we can just go to the next slide. <clears throat> so the Bipartisan Policy Center is a DC based think tank. Uh, our mission is really to cultivate uh, common ground across political parties. And so telehealth is thankfully uh, one of the most bipartisan areas of health policy in Congress. Uh, Republicans and Democrats seem to see the value in virtual care, uh, along with millions of Americans that have been getting their care through virtual visits uh, throughout the pandemic. It's often referred to uh, inside the Beltway and across the country as a silver lining of COVID-19. So. It's an uh, exciting area to be working in. Um, go to the next slide. <clears throat> so when the pandemic uh, first hit, significant changes were made, and uh, some of them uh, were just gone through by the previous speaker at the state level. But on the federal level, uh, we often are looking at what happened in Medicare and a lot of restrictions around uh, geographic limitations to where the benefit could be used uh, it was often seen Prior to the pandemic, telehealth access was really seen as a way for folks living in rural America to access specialty care. Is really the paradigm that had been created for its use, um, and also for certain uh, for folks with certain diagnoses to access uh, care. Uh, that entire paradigm really shifted during the pandemic, and. Uh, the geographic limitations were waived, access was opened um, to all Medicare beneficiaries to access care. The site limitations were waived where people had to physically, prior to the pandemic, travel to only designated sites to receive telehealth um, visits. They could now um, access all of their virtual visits from home. Um, audio only was a modality. Uh, previously really um, not used uh, and reimbursed in the way that it was um, during the pandemic. So to account for all the different um, limitations that people had accessing broadband and also having um, the ability and the, the, the tech savvy to use uh, the devices needed, all of the requirements for two-way video um, were also waived during the pandemic. And that became known as audio only telehealth, which is, which is essentially just a, a phone visit with your provider. Um, additionally, the um, major, major change was to reimburse 100% of parity. So at parity with in person services, all the, um, all the telehealth visits and the phone visits, audio only telehealth visits were all reimbursed at parity uh, with in person visits. And so those are just uh, some of the some of the changes. Um, there were also changes to the number of services that became eligible for telehealth. Uh, there were changes um, that relax relax requirements around licensing, et cetera. So we can go to the next slide. Um, and what I wanted to share was we actually. Um, did at the Bipartisan Policy Center a major uh, Medicare data analysis. And we often look at Medicare as the leader um, in the insurer space because often where Medicare goes um, with the policy as uh, usually follow many other insurers. And so we wanted to see um, during COVID, actually pre-COVID through the early part of the pandemic and through Q3 of 21, we did an analysis to see what was happening with telehealth um, utilization. And um, we see 
you know, this is all set against the backdrop. Um, this policy environment has completely changed and there's a growing need for um, behavioral health services. Um, and we see basically we created um, a major shift in the behavioral health care delivery system um, that as the previous speaker mentioned has uh, really sustained, um, been sustained uh, beyond the peak of the pandemic. So on the left, you can see, um, you can see total Medicare visits um, and the percent of those visits that were delivered by telehealth. So really an anemic use of telehealth prior to the pandemic, um, very, very infrequent given all of the policy restrictions that were placed on the benefit. Then as those policy were restrictions were lifted and the pandemic hit, um, a huge um, increase in the use of the benefit. Um, and then at, if you look at it over all types of visits, um, it does begin to rubber band back to prior uh, to the pandemic. Although it still remains much higher than um, pre-pandemic times, there is a significant drop off in the use of telehealth if you look overall over all types of care. But if you focus in on just behavioral health, um, and that's the chart to the right, you see that by the end of 2021, um, we still see 44% um, of all behavioral health visits for Medicare beneficiaries remain um, via telehealth. And so telehealth really became a major part of the behavioral health care delivery system. Um, and, you know, uh, I'm very excited to see research continue to be done to show how much that um, that trend continues to sustain itself. It obviously will only sustain itself to the point at which the policy environment continues to support it. Um, so go to the next slide. So BPC has been working for the last several years to develop evidence-based federal policy for the effective use of telehealth. And I just wanted to go through some of the findings, additional findings from that Medicare data analysis that we conducted. Uh, we found um, med beneficiaries, which traditionally is not a group that I would have um, you know, pegged for Medicare beneficiaries, not traditionally being a group I would peg for using a lot of telehealth prior to, um, to the pandemic, but they still continued to use um, uh, telehealth at 40 times the rate um, pre-pandemic, um, post-pandemic as pre-pandemic. And then we did see actually, once you took away all the restrictions of, um, of of the policy uh, restrictions on the benefit, primary care actually made up the largest share of telehealth visits in Medicare. And most of those are happening within the context of existing uh, patient provider relationships. So established, uh, established patient provider relationships, which tends to be a talking point um, in policy circles is how do you continue um, the, the use of the benefit and should it, um, should, should people who don't have a prior relationship with a patient um, or sh with a provider continue to be able to access that care virtually. Well, we found at least in the Medicare beneficiary population um, and for primary care visits, the vast majority of those visits are happening with providers that you already know. If you go to the next slide. The story is a little bit different when you zoom in and just look at behavioral health visits. Um, a lot of telehealth, is, a lot of the behavioral health visits are delivered via telehealth, but when you look at them um, in terms of which, which of these visits are happening in the context of established patient provider relationships, the number is actually uh, only about 65%. And that is interesting because it could be indicating that these access barriers to behavioral health services, you know, only one in three Americans live in an area where you have access to behavioral health providers, and so you may be um, seeing a bit of early evidence and early indication that um, during this time, we did actually incentivize more uh, behavioral health treatment than was happening before the pandemic. Um, the other thing that has been a really um, big interest uh, to continue to study is around the audio only modality. So, a lot of care was delivered via telephone visits. And so this is prior to the pandemic, something that was uh, really just not done um, and not paid for separately. 
And we at BPC do remain cautious about this as a modality. So while it does provide this very important lifeline for older and rural um, populations um, who are disproportionately affected by you know, barriers to accessing services, we don't really fully understand the impact that this modality has on the quality of care and that it will have on healthcare spending. And so this is an area that we really do want to continue to watch um, and see what the evidence um, shakes out to be. Go to the next slide. So we found that, and this is consistent across uh, other payers as well, that really when you take away the restriction of this uh, benefit being something that's just for people living in rural areas, that actually the use uh, is much higher in urban areas. Um, so telehealth visit rates were directly correlated with population density. So the closer that you get to this, um, to a city, you are actually using, relying on telehealth more, which is interesting. Um, also an interesting finding, and this is not consistent across all pairs, but it did come through um, significantly in our study of Medicare data, is that um, most uh, minorities are more likely to use telehealth than uh, white non-Hispanics. And then other interesting findings were that you know, those who have um, beneficiaries that have disabilities, um, they're eligible for Medicare because of a disability. Um, they're duly eligible for both Medicare and Medicaid, so low income and Medicare uh, eligible. And those who have more chronic conditions um, are more likely to use telehealth services. We can go to the next one. So, um, I just wanted so that is those were the main takeaways from our data analysis and I just wanted to um, share just a bit of a thumbnail on where we are today. Um, we at the end of last year, Congress passed an Omni um, that extended for two years the telehealth flexibilities. So we have until December 31st, 2024 um, for Medicare uh, and what is hopefully going to happen during that time is a real examination of additional evidence to say, you know, what of the of the things that have been turned on and the policies that have been relaxed, what should continue to be at that level or if anything needs to be dialed back. Um, just at a high level, a couple other major things that happened at the end of last year um, in the omnibus. Um, Congress passed uh, additional support for the um, Behavioral Health Crisis Line 988 Lifeline Program. They also extended coverage uh, of, for Medicare um, to marriage and family therapists and licensed mental health counselors. The X waiver went away, which was a huge change, so um, a big barrier to um, substance use treatment. And um, many more slots were added um, for residencies in psychiatry. Um, go to the next one. And then just a few things as we go through between now and the end of uh, the telehealth flexibilities ending or when we need to have another decision made by um, federal policymakers about what will happen next. Um, actually, just on Friday when I finished these slides, um, I learned at the end of the day that uh, there were changes, uh, the proposed rule finally came out for um, what will happen for uh, after the pandemic to SUD treatment um, and controlled substance prescribing. And so the DEA did release uh, proposed rules around um, controlled substance prescribing. Um, and I will just share from my high level, I haven't yet read this full proposed rule yet, but um, there will be new in-person uh, visit requirements um, to get certain uh, prescriptions for controlled substances. Included in that is actually for buprenorphine and the treatment of uh, OUD. So that was an interesting um, addition and we will be commenting on that. Um, and then the, the other thing to keep an eye on for this year is that uh, most of the reimbursement decisions, so everything, um, has continued to be reimbursed at parity with in-person visits. So both the audio only and the um, telehealth um, visits for Medicare 
and we will be looking to see what happens in the Medicare physician fee schedule at the end of this year um, to see if any of that changes for 24. And I think that that is it. Is there another slide after this? Okay. Yeah, so I just went ahead and wanted to share some of our work um, and hopefully these slides will be just distributed and people can see, but, um, you know, I'll just say that one of the things that um, we've been looking at is while while this time during the pandemic has been absolutely necessary to um, loosen the flexibilities and many different um, simultaneous changes to policy were made. I think um, it, you know, it was rightly, rightly done, um, but now is the time to really look critically at telehealth policy to determine uh, what kinds of guardrails we really need to put into place um, and figure out what's the right dose of telehealth and how exactly um, people should be accessing it. So I will end my uh, remarks there. And if anyone has any questions, happy to take any questions. Thank you so much, Julia. Um, we do have a few minutes for questions. There was one question in the chat from Ryan Jelinek. Um, Ryan asked, maybe I misunderstood. Um, <clears throat> I questioned that last slide and that white non-Hispanics use telehealth less. This seems to contradict most other data sets I've seen. Yeah, it was, um, so this is all Medicare beneficiaries and I have seen um, other, um, other, I guess, in commercial, um, and I'm not sure if specifically in any Medicaid data sets what they're finding, but uh, people of color um, in the Medicare program seem to use uh, telehealth at a higher rate. And it was pretty significant. It was like two percentage points higher across all, um, across all uh, non-white groups. Um, and so some of that may be just um, people of color lacking um, transportation, having less flexibility to take off time of time from work, um, and they just disproportionately relied more on uh, telehealth. But it is certainly not a consistent finding across all types of uh, payers. And I'll just say this is a Medicare fee for service. Um, and I have seen others that, you know, take in um, Medicare Advantage data too. Great, thank you. Um, if anyone else has any questions, we have time for probably one more if you wanna put it in the chat. And then I also wanna call out Megan Lowe said, um, here's the DEA decision that Julia just referred to. Drug Enforcement Agency announced the proposal of permanent rules for the prescribing of controlled medications via telemedicine, expanding patient access to critical therapies beyond the scheduled end of the COVID-19 public health emergency. And Megan dropped the link for the press release in the chat as well for anyone who is interested. Um, but I will do a last call if anyone has any questions for Julia. Well, thank you so much, Julia. We're so happy that you're able to join us for the workshop today. Um, and Thanks. yeah, thank you. And now we will take a 15 minute break. And then when we reconvene at two o'clock central time in 15 minutes, we will dive into the policy informed telehealth research panel. So we will see you all in about 15 minutes.
Gina, I thought I just checked it. Can, can you hear me okay? Awesome. Thanks. All right. Hi, everyone. Welcome back from the break. So we will now dive into the policy informed telehealth research panel and this panel will be moderated by Jean Abraham, who is a professor and the head of the division of health policy and management at the University of Minnesota School of Public Health. She is also a member of the technical advisory group for Minnesota's telehealth study. So, Jean, I will hand things over to you. Amelia, thank you so much. And I want to thank MDH as well as the Center for Evidence Based Policy for putting this workshop together and really creating an opportunity for researchers and policy makers to come together to really have an important conversation. Um, we're really fortunate today to have three scholars um, representing a variety of institutions, and I'll introduce each of them here very briefly. Um, the game plan for the next hour or so is to have, um, we'll start with uh, having each of our panelists offer just a few minutes of opening remarks, a little bit more about their backgrounds and their work in the telehealth space. We then have a series of structured questions that I'll facilitate and we'll have a lead, lead respondent and then we'll rotate around. And then we've saved time today for about 15 minutes for audience questions. So I encourage you to put your questions in the chat and those will be um, reviewed and then we will have some time uh, to have a dialogue. All right, so let me begin by introducing our panelists. Um, today we have Dr. Atib Marotra, who is a professor in the Department of Healthcare Policy at Harvard Medical School. Um, his research focuses on delivery innovations and their impact on access, quality, and spending. We also have Dr. Annette Totten. She is an associate professor in the Oregon Health and Science University Department of Medical Informatics and Clinical Epidemiology and the OHSU PSU School of Public Health. And we have Dr. Gianni Yu, who is an assistant professor in the Division of Health Policy and Economics of the Department of Population Health Sciences at Weill Cornell Medical College. So welcome to our panelists. And let's go ahead and get started um, um, with some introductions and just a brief summary of your work. And perhaps to kick us off, we'll have Annette get us started this afternoon. Be on mute. Can everyone hear me? Mm -hmm. Okay, great. So um, as a health services researcher, I'm more on the social science and organizational side of things than the clinical. And I've had an interest in system issues and practice change for a while. Um, I've been at the Pacific Northwest Evidence-Based Practice Center, which is at OHSU in the Department of Medical Informatics and Clinical Epidemiology since 2010. My first systematic review there was on public reporting of quality measures and examples of other sort of systems reviews that I've done have been on health information exchange, home-based primary care, and right now I'm working on behavioral health integration into primary care. Um, before I arrived at Oregon, our former department chair led one of the early technology assessments that ARC did on telemedicine, it was telemedicine for the Medicare population done in 2001 and then updated in 2006. So the sort of confluence of my interest in sort of more systems issues and the EPC having done some work in telehealth led to my involvement in reviews. And if you look at final reports right now in ARC, um, on ARC's evidence-based um, program, there are five large reviews and I've led three of them <laughs> and contributed to one other. So I started off in 2016 doing an evidence map of systematic reviews in response to a request from Congress to ARC. Um, and that request was made at the behest of the Telehealth Association for evidence that telehealth works, <laughs> which is always fun to get a request like that. And then from that review that led to ARC requesting a review on telehealth for consultations. 
and I let that one was completed in 2019, um, which had been one of the topics in the map. We said it looked like there was evidence, but hadn't been synthesized. And then most recently, I led a review for the NIH Pathways to Prevention Program on Provider to Provider Telehealth for Rural Healthcare Delivery. Um, and then I've made some small contributions to review led my, by my colleague, Amy Cantor, on telehealth for women's preventive services. And I had absolutely nothing to do with the very interesting review on telehealth during COVID that the EPC at Johns Hopkins completed. Um, so the topics that I've focused on as a systematic reviewer or someone who works on evidence synthesis projects is, first of all, I read a lot of studies a lot of bad studies um, and occasionally a few good ones. Um, so I don't wanna use up the intro to get into specifics, but just a couple of, cause I think we'll dive into these things as we get into the questions. Um, but EPC, Evidence-Based Practice Center work is um, centered on identifying, evaluating, and then synthesizing evidence. Um, and so that's focusing on what's been done. And we did that with the evidence map and then delving into some specific applications or functions of telehealth like consultation, or then maybe use in a particular setting like rural health. And to be honest, they asked in our intro to say what our key learnings are. And, you know, they're pretty common to systems change and practice change. And maybe even I'd say cliched, you know, change is hard. Even when it seems like it's logical, that doesn't mean it's easy. Um, and then systems are designed exactly to produce the outcomes that they, you know, produce. So, you know, good intentions, training champions might be necessary, but they're not sufficient. And we really have to think about the environment and this, why we're talking about policy, right? The complex interactions of things that constrain or support what you want to do. Um, but then I think the optimistic corollary is that change is possible. And, and in this case, we're talking about an interesting situation where we don't want to waste a good crisis. I mean, we telehealth had been limping along in some ways, increasing, but not exactly, you know, blasting off um, before COVID. But many of the barriers that we'd been chipping away at were suddenly gone. And it's really interesting to think about what we can learn from that. And I think the other thing, the challenges we're going to be talking about too, is the sheer scope of telehealth. And then I think that means thinking about, um, you know, telehealth can mean everything from a phone call to remote surgery. That's kind of nuts, right? <laughs> um, and then to think about another challenge is applicability. You know, I'm all for full employment for researchers, but realistically, we can't study every application of telehealth for every condition for every population. So we have to think about when are we willing to translate results from one situation to another. So that's kind of my intro and what I've been working on. And I'm really excited about studying telehealth because I like looking across conditions and settings for commonalities for learning. And also, if we get this right, we can make people better. <laughs> very nice, very nice. Annette, thank you for some great insights to kick us off, both in terms of resources that are available, but also just highlighting the complexity and multidimensionality of telehealth. Let's go to Gianni next for some opening remarks. Sure, thank you, Jean. Uh, um, I am also a health services researcher. Um, as Jean said, I am an assistant professor in the Division of Health Policy and Economics at Wall Cornell. Um, and my work thus far um, has primarily revolved around studying uh, who the providers of telehealth are um, and the impacts of telehealth utilization on um, you know, access to care, quality, and cost of care, uh, leveraging quasi-experimental study designs wherever I can, um, and uh, you know, also leveraging healthcare claims data and, and linking healthcare claims data with EHR data um, to evaluate the impact of these telehealth initiatives on um, patient outcomes. Um, and then my newer work now is moving into the sphere of examining the use of telehealth um, and other sorts of innovative healthcare delivery strategies to improve um, medical care and the quality of life for nursing home residents um, with a focus on patients with Alzheimer's disease and related dementias. Um, and I'll also just um, end by saying that over the last uh, few years, I've worked pretty closely with folks at uh, Minnesota Department of Health to examine um, telehealth use within the Minnesota APCD. So I will try to bring in some of the newer insights that we have, um, you know, from looking at the variation of telehealth patterns across payer groups in Minnesota. 
Great. Thanks, Gianni. Appreciate that. All right. And then let's have Ativ um, kick us off with your kind of introduction, kind of your work in this space and uh, anything else you'd like to share as we get the conversation rolling. Well, thanks, Jean, and also thanks uh, for hosting and uh, the Department of Health for uh, hosting this really important meeting. Um, you know, why interested in telehealth? You know, I think that we talk so much about different ways that we can improve the healthcare system from insurance expansions to uh, benefit design, but I think we don't spend enough time on delivery innovations, and that's what's really motivating my work, which is what impact is this going to have? We've been doing a lot of stuff on telehealth, and one of the themes that I'll try to emphasize today is that I, while I take Annette's comment very importantly, we can't study everything, I also really try to challenge folks that ask me, does telemedicine work? What's the impact of telemedicine on quality, et cetera? And really just to emphasize how foolish that question would, would be sound if we said, do drugs work? We would ask the question, which patient which clinical circumstance and which drug. And I think that that same framework needs to be applied to tele telehealth. It's a really annoying answer. I really get it. It's like, you wanna know the answer here, but it is going to be a much more nuanced answer. And that's what we're finding in our work in terms of the impact. And so along that theme, we've been studying a lot of variations of telehealth and their impact. For example, what's the impact of remote patient monitoring for patients with high blood pressure? What about telemedicine for the treatment of opioid use disorder? How about telestroke in the emergency department? How, what impact is that having on patients who come in with symptoms of a stroke? Women who just had a baby and they're breastfeeding, what's the impact of telelactation? Um, and we've also been looking at disparities in the use of telemedicine and regulatory changes such as uh, licensure laws. So a broad array of different kinds of projects. Um, in terms of just some emerging lessons, and I hope that we can start to get into this a, a lot more um, as we move forward. Um, there's a lot, first of all, a lot to learn, but I guess the couple of emerging lessons is that I have not seen any evidence that telehealth saves money. In some cases, we found it's net neutral. In some cases, we're seeing it's increasing spending. But I do try to, at least I haven't seen any evidence that it's reducing spending. The second is on variation in quality. In some of the applications we've looked at, we found that telehealth improves quality and results in uh, increase in um, uh, and improvements in mortality, at least in one case. But in many other cases, we're seeing it leads to a greater utilization with no clear evidence that's really resulting in better outcomes. And lastly, on the access side, a kind of emerging lesson, which is maybe one of those duh findings, which is when we offer telehealth to all patients, I'm concerned that the data we're seeing shows that those who are more advantaged are more likely to use it. And this could widen disparities as opposed to narrowing disparities, which is what I've hoped we could use telehealth for. And so those are a couple of lessons which I, we, we can build upon or touch up, uh, come back to later on. So thanks again, Jean. Great. Thank you, Atif. And, and excellent, uh, excellent kind of themes that I'm sure we will get back to um, during the next 45 minutes or so. All right. So let's go ahead and, um, you know, as was alluded to, there are lots of issues. There's lots of applications. Um, but I'm going to ask Annette to maybe kick us off as we think about, you know, when we think about evaluation and we think about the different kind of system performance outcomes, whether it's access, quality, patient experience, equity, or spending, you know, what do you think, how do you think about the particular research questions that we need to ask and then be able to answer um, to inform decision decisions? And when you think about that, you know, how, you know, as what came up in the introduction, it makes me think about, you know, how broad versus narrow does it need to be or nuanced um, in terms of where we have evidence and where don't we have evidence that we need to still fill? So, Annette, let's have you lead it off and then we'll rotate around to the other panelists. Oh, you're on mute, I think. I think we'd be good at this by now, right? <laughs> and still, you get a little stage fright and you forget to hit the button. Um, so I definitely agree that, you know, it, asking if telehealth works is like asking if a drug works. But then there are some things that are like asking if the generic or the main brand name brand work the same. You know, if remote patient monitoring works for congestive heart failure, how different is it 
to use it for CPOD and can we learn, you know, across that? Are there some functions that are similar enough um, that we can try to make some generalizations? And that's just a question for people to think about. I'm not sure we know the answer. So, but I think when we think about evaluations and and what we want to know, the, the hardest part, and we've sort of alluded to it, but we haven't said it outright, so I want to say it, is in a lot of the studies I read, it's amazing, but I can't tell what people think the telehealth was going to do. It's not clear if the goal was to increase access, whether it was to replace in-person activities, supplement in-person activities with additional care, provide data, reduce costs, or somehow better distribute scarce resources. And it's really hard to do any type of an evaluation if you don't know what your goal was. And most, a lot of telehealth um, literature doesn't say what the goal of telehealth was. Um, so that's kind of the first hurdle we have to get over for each application that we're talking about. I think we have to go into it with an idea of, you know, at least a model in our head of what we hope to accomplish. Then you can think about what's the best question, what's the best comparator, what's the best outcome. And then I think telehealth research, like all research, sometimes suffers from using the data that's available and not the data that would answer the question that's important. So my example of this is the telestrokes work. A lot of the telestroke measures door to needle time, which is, you know, telestroke is supposed to get people to treatment faster, but then it reports inpatient mortality and doesn't find much difference. And maybe that's because the people who are going to die from strokes die from strokes and what getting them treatment faster does is reduce disability, but that's harder to measure right disability at 6 months. So we have some problems in the telehealth evaluations of thinking about what outcomes really matter. Um, and that's that's, I think, important and we have found, you know, so the map I did back in 2016 is kind of out of date now. But there was a lot of research already on some topics like remote patient monitoring, like communication and counseling for people with chronic conditions and behavioral health. So the question is, at what point do we sort of stop studying effectiveness and focus more on implementation and sustainability for certain topics? And those are very different. That's very different types of work. Um, then when we got into consultation work, we got a bit more granular. And, you know, we found things like remote ICUs reduced mortality or specialty telehealth can reduce ED time or, you know, telehealth consults, you know, part of EMS can reduce heart attack mortality. But, you know, but they're, like you said, they're for very specific things. And then other things, there isn't evidence and you have to decide where do we need more evidence. Um, and then I guess the third one I worked on that I'd say would an help answer this question is for rural health. You know, there wasn't a lot of information on who was actually using it. Getting good data on who's using telehealth, how in rural areas was not easy. Um, and again, there's very specific areas that have been studied that you can find benefits. Um, keeping neonates in rural hospitals is an example where the study seemed to suggest, you know, telehealth works. Outpatient care for depression and diabetes, emergency care again for stroke and heart attack. And then we also looked at other things like education and mentoring for that. We looked at like echo programs and, you know, and, and whether those can improve confidence or change provider behavior. And there's much fewer studies that look at patient outcomes from those. But across all of these studies, the barriers are pretty similar. The details might be different, but it's time, technology, and resources, right? <laughs> and, and then the other issue is because telehealth is a systems issue, right? Um, it's a mode of delivery. It's not an actual care. You know, you have to think about what's the most rigorous design, and it's probably not going to be an individual level RCT most of the time. But on the other hand, these relatively descriptive pre post studies with no control for risk of bias or hist historic changes probably don't help us or help decision makers move forward. So that would be sort of my overview of what's happening with the evaluation and where there's still gaps. Excellent. Thank you, Annette. And I know you've got kind of the big picture view given all of your work uh, with EPC uh, mm -hmm. reporting. Um, let's go for any additional thoughts from Ativ or Gianni on kind of the, you know, where do we have evidence and where do you still see critical gaps when you think about the landscape? Either of you? 
Okay. Uh, well, I'll just Go make ahead. one quick point, which is, um, and maybe building off Annette's thing, uh, where she was also talking about bad studies. This is a frustrated shade frustration for me uh, in there, because you're going to go out there and see thousands and thousands and thousands of studies that have been published on telehealth. And it's unfortunate that this field is, has a lot of crap. It's just really unfortunate with a lot of pre post studies saying, look, this is what happened to 100 patients who did this. And while I get it, there is so much selection bias out there in terms of who the heck is going to be crazy enough to use telehealth that those studies don't really address those things. And so therefore, it's this weird paradox where there's a lot of paper, but I'm not sure much strong evidence to help us in many circumstances. So I don't want to paint too broad a brush, hopefully not on my own papers, but there is a lot of um, out there that it, and it, very, it makes it very difficult for a policymaker. Because somebody, and this is in particular true of a lot of these private companies who are telemedicine only companies who are coming before employers and health plans and states saying, hey, here's some evidence that our model works because it was published in some journal. But unfortunately, in some cases, that I don't think really answers the question. Um, so something for folks to think about and I think uh, really emphasizing why there's so much to learn. Very good, and we'll get back to study design here shortly, but I would I would concur. There's a lot out there, a lot of variable quality and um, challenging to kind of sort through, sift through because of the pure quantity of studies out there now. Gianni, any uh, thoughts on the this big picture question before we move on? Um, so I'm hoping to get a little bit deeper into the study design question. So okay. I'll save my time. You'll for that. Save your time yeah. for later. All right. Very good. All <laughs> right. So we're gonna we're gonna start talking about data and measurement issues, which I think will help us to think about kind of quality. How do we produce you know higher quality research, and you know how do we think about um, um, how do we think about kind of what makes for high quality work, or how we're going to overcome some of these challenges to generate better quality evidence? So we'll start with Ativ here. So, um, what do you think are the biggest data and measurement related issues um, that we need to address in order to assess the impact of telehealth, however narrowly or broadly defined you want to um, scope it, um, in order to really inform policy making? And so that could be thinking about. Um, you know, how we measure different types of telehealth or how we think about um, the data sources available. Yeah, there's a number of things here. So I'll try to just touch upon a couple of uh, key things, Gene, and then others, I'm sure, and, and Gianni will uh, jump in with some other stuff. Um, I think the point that has been made to me by many folks, policymakers, is we've had this huge experiment in telehealth in the last three years. Can't we exploit that to make uh, uh, what, see what's, what impact it's had. So we're moving away from RCTs and going to observational studies. And those data generally come from electronic health records from big health systems or from claims data from health plans or Medicare, et cetera. And there's a lot of issues that come up that I think people should be aware of. The first is how the heck do you distinguish what kind of care is happening? Um, we've done some work just to kind of get into the weeds a little bit. A lot of interest, important focus on audio-only telemedicine visits. And I don't think in 2023 we really know the answer of how much audio-only telemedicine is happening. The data we look at when we try to contrast what people say in surveys versus claims, we're th I think there's a lot more audio-only telemedicine that's happening that is actually reported out there, either in electronic health records or in claims. And that's just reflection of how the data is coded and there's no real incentive right now for a doc to code it correctly. The other thing is, is that there's a lot of telehealth that's happening out there that's not captured in the data. So we could, in electronic health record data or as well as claims data, we can often see when people put the right code in or put the right, but we've been doing some work on remote patient monitoring. And I'm just amazed by how many docs are using it out there that never code for it. And so that, and either in their records or any place else. And so you have this absence of information. So I think it's one of those things for people to be aware of that uh, we have to uh, be uh, those uh, data limitation. I'll just highlight two more data limitations that are really important. Um, we do have a problem that the clinical model that many telehealth companies or other organizations are using is not well aligned with the data. Well, what I mean by that is, is that I'll just try to be a little concrete. Firefly Health is a primary care practice, telehealth only. 
And what they try to do is use their app to try to communicate and message with their patients. They send reminders. They try to have tons of little interactions with their clinicians, uh, their patients, because they feel that's a better clinical model. Whether it works or not, we can debate. But none of that is captured in the data. Because, you know, who the heck's going to code a little message, a portal message, et cetera. And so when we try to compare Firefly Health to another primary care practice, we're not really making a good apples to apples comparison because they're not focused on the visit as we've normally counted it. And then the last piece that I wanted to highlight in terms of data limitations that this is just a buyer beware kind of thing is there is an important and critical focus on the use of telehealth in terms of and who is using it in terms of uh, rurality, race, ethnicity. But we have to acknowledge that in many of these data sets, we don't really know someone's race or ethnicity. Mm -hmm. Even when it's like in electronic health record data, where does it come from? Often it's someone who looked at the front office staff, looked at a person, and decided what race they are. That doesn't work. And even in self-reported data like Medicare, we have ample evidence that often there's a lot of biases in those data. So we, again, we should do this work. It's a really critical work, but we have to be uh, aware of a number of these data limitations from the type of care, how much is being captured, the, you know, how the care is being provided and some of these data on demographics. Great, Atib, quick follow-up question for you with respect to the second point on capturing uh, interactions uh, through your Firefly Health example. Is some of that tied to the contracting models that those primary care providers have or kind of their payment structures such that they're not incented to code, um, maybe because they're capitated or some other um, other arrangement? Yeah, so I think for many of these telehealth only <coughs> models, the ideal way they want to get paid is on a capitated basis per month per, because it doesn't make sense to put a bill in when the bill itself costs 20 bucks <laughs> or a one or two minute message. Okay. And so I think that's the way they would like to be paid in the data that we have seen. It's been very difficult for them to be paid that way. And they're often kind of retro fitting visit based models to do so. Others can weigh in about that. So, um, okay. uh, but that's been at least my experience and a little bit of why there's a disconnect between the model and how they're actually being paid currently. Sounds good. Thank you. Let's go to Gianni next. So we've got issues of measurement and data and kind of really thinking through, you know, what is it that, uh, you know, how well is, you know, what are these challenges and um, what do you do you envision whether there's any some solutions that researchers can be thinking about to address it? Yeah, so it would be helpful to talk through this if um, uh, Debbie could share the slides uh, that I sent over. Great, thank you. Okay. So, um, you know, talking through, um, and I think this actually uh, is a really nice follow up to what Atib just was talking about and talking through some of the possible data sources um, where we can, you know, uh, construct quality measures to start to get at what the impact of telehealth is on the quality of care. Um, many of the quality outcomes that are, uh, you know, widely used in telehealth research is um, also, you know, aligns very widely with um, health services research more generally. Um, so I have here just a few quality measures um, that are that are pretty widely used, and I, I won't get into each of them specifically, um, but I will say that they are they all rely on uh, different types of data. So you can see potentially preventable emergency department visits. Unplanned hospital admissions uh, will rely on claims data typically. Um, another outcome of interest, I think, is uh, continuity of care, um, especially with respect to telehealth visits, since this could potentially be um, uh, a mediator between, uh, you know, having a telehealth visit and downstream quality outcomes. We want to be able to measure the extent to which um, a patient is able to uh, see a, a provider more frequently, um, you know, a usual provider of care, for instance. Um, you know, in, in some work that we've done, we've also collected patient reported outcomes to get at the acceptability, 
um, of, of telemedicine visits to patients, um, their you know, overall satisfaction with telemedicine versus in-person patients. And there's a growing number of validated surveys out there that can be adapted and deployed for that reason. Um, and then I also just want to include here that there are a number of, um, you know, condition specific measures of disease control um, that are validated and that can be used, um, you know, if you have EHR data um, to be able to examine the impact of telehealth for a specific chronic condition. Um, so next slide. And then just really quickly, some of the pros and cons of using claims data versus EHR data. And Ativa already talked about some of this, but you know, pros, it's really easy to identify telehealth visits using a combination of um, data elements in the claims data. Um, however, that data, of course, is not entirely reliable, particularly prior to the pandemic and particularly for Medicare beneficiaries leading to that undercount of telehealth visits. Um, the nice thing um, that I wanted to add is that many claims data sets, including the Minnesota APCD, for the most part, um, will capture the entirety of a patient's healthcare utilization, really allowing for that, um, you know, comparison of downstream or overall healthcare utilization and quality. Um, uh, and that's that's a benefit that um, EHR data typically does not have, um, since those data are, are health system specific. Um, however, as as Atif said, we can't really reliably identify modality, um, especially in the claims data, um, and we can't capture telehealth visits that are, of course, paid for out of pocket or not covered by insurance. And just to add on to what Atif said, um, you know, we've tried to study um, these large. Uh, telehealth vendors, uh, uh, you know, in the claims data, but Medicare, traditional Medicare, for instance, does not pay for teledoc visits. So that's something that does not even show up in the claims data itself. Um, you know, if a uh, fee for service Medicare Benny beneficiary uses a teledoc service. And then with um, EHR data, um, one potential uh, pro, depending on, you know, the quality of the data is that you can, um, you know, potentially identify the modality of the encounter using um, data fields that where you sort of search through the, EH, the uh, strings within the EHR data. Um, and I actually have an example here, um, Debbie, if you click, um, so, you know, in a, in a current uh, project, we're looking through um, certain data fields that are capturing encounter type to look for strings related to audio versus video, you know, related to phone versus online. So we can, you know, at least somewhat capture more of the modality of the telehealth service itself. Um, the other pro of an EHR data is that, um, again, depending on the quality of your data, you may be able to get at um, things like missed appointments, no shows, um, more, uh, uh, you know, patient level. Uh, social risk, uh, which you would not be able to get in, in claims data um, and things like primary language. Um, and of course, the major con with EHR data is that it is typically health system specific. And so you miss all of the care that is not within um, that specific healthcare system. And so I can stop there. Great. Um, thank you, Gianni. That was um, really helpful to kind of see that kind of. Uh, and a summary of the pros and cons of the different uh, data types. Of course, you focused on claims and EHRs. Um, surveys may also be used from time to time for other purposes uh, and that we see research kind of coming out descriptive, particularly descriptive work. Um, I want to next go to Annette to see if you have any additional thoughts you'd like to share regarding either measurement, um, measurement challenges or data challenges um, before we move to kind of study design. Fine going ahead and going to study design because I think that's where it's going to get fun. <laughs> All right. Yes. Okay. So, um, obviously, uh, we started off the conversation today talking about the variable quality of studies. Um, and, you know, part of the challenges we face have to do with uh, being able to deploy study designs that allow us to get closer to causal inference or at least. Uh, feel more confident in the estimation of the effects of, uh, of deploying care via this modality. Um, so, as we think about it, you know, what types of study designs can best assess, um, you know, best assess kind of uh, either out, uh, spending quality or health outcomes? And what are some of the bumps in the road or things that we see that we wish we didn't see in publication? Um, I will actually, Gianni, since you just started, I'm going to actually go to Ativ first and let him take this up. Yeah, I, um, 
And if Debbie could put up slide 38, that'd be really helpful um, for me, at least uh, maybe a picture is helpful in this context. Um, but I do want to emphasize, what do we care about? I think there's two major things that I'm trying to think about when I'm doing the research. The first is um, how do we address the selection issues that people, if you just study those who are using telehealth, they are likely to look healthier and do better because they there's something about them so uh, that led them to use telehealth. So I think that's one major issue, selection issues of who uses telehealth. The second major challenge is that as researchers, we use the term the counterfactual. What the heck does that mean? It means like we want to study someone who uses tele versus not. We need the not. And what happened during the pandemic is everyone you started using it. So how do we, where's the not coming from the counterfactual so that we can estimate the impact of telehealth? That's a real problem for us. And I think when I've been asked, can't you use the uh, pandemic experience to exploit that, it, it does create a bit of a quandary. I wanted just to throw out one design that we've been using in some of our ongoing work. It's not the design, it's not the best design. There are a lot of problems with it, but maybe tries to illustrate a little bit of why, uh, one way we try to overcome that. Um, in some work that we've been doing, we've been taking health systems or practices or individual clinicians and we look in 2020 and we divide them up into their telehealth use. So Annette could be a high telehealth user. She's at 80%, Gianni's at 50% and I'm on the low end at 20%. We put them into bins to try to look. And so now we're comparing Annette to me in the sense of the high telemedicine user versus the low telemedicine user. And Debbie, I think this has animation. So if you could click through. And so then what we do is we assign the patients to the providers before the pandemic. You ideally that helps a lot, right? Because if I know that Annette's an awesome telemedicine using doc, I might go to her and I, I wanna avoid that. So I don't wanna, I wanna avoid that selection issue. So I assign the patients to the pre-pandemic period. And then we also have to acknowledge that Annette may be a better doc than me. And we wanna see what the change is in care, not what is looks like afterwards. So what we've done in some of this work is we've compared the care in 2019 to the care in 2021. And then we compare those changes, the, the lingo that we sometimes use as a difference in difference framework across those quint quintiles of telehealth use. So to summarize that idea that we're comparing the changes in care among the high telemedicine practices or clinicians versus the low to try to estimate the impact of telehealth. And when doing so, we're trying to overcome the selection issues that I described and that counterfactual need. This is just one study design that, and I'm sure there's others, but it gives you an illustration of potentially one way to move forward in terms of study design. Thanks, Debbie, for uh, pushing through that. Go ahead, Jean, if you, were you about to. Great. No, I was just going to um, add. So, so that was actually really useful as a an, as an example of how to think kind of very creatively uh, around exploiting kind of uh, kind of before and after and and thinking through kind of uh, variation in um, uh, in practices to be able to try to understand and measure. Gianni, I wanted to kind of switch to you because, of course, um, you've got I know some work given your time, Minnesota, um, you know, thinking through another way to kind of uh, identify effects. So do you want to talk just a little bit about that example and whether there may be opportunities going forward to use something like that? Sure. Um, Debbie, can you throw the slide, throw up the slides again? <laughs> Thank you so much. We're keeping Debbie busy this afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of toggling. Um, so, uh, and we can click through this. So next slide, next slide. Um, and Ativ already did a very good job of um, of introducing counterfactual and um, selection bias to us. Um, this is again just like a very quick primer on you know why we actually need causal study designs to either randomize or as if randomize telehealth uh, to to patients, um, uh, whether that's the telehealth visit itself or simply the exposure access to telehealth. Um, and so, a key question that I always like to ask myself when I'm working on a study is 
you know, if we do find any association between telehealth visits and patient outcomes, is it the telehealth itself that causes the outcome? Or is it actually due to another factor? And, and those groups of factors I would categorize as confounders. And this is what causes selection bias and any sort of, sort of spurious associations between um, you know, your telehealth visit, setting telehealth visits and, and the impact on patient outcomes. Um, and so we would need to account for this obviously through experimental design or through statistical analysis. And we can go on to the next slide. Um, and um, so I, I won't spend a lot of time here, but you know you can think of, for instance, uh, patient demographic and socioeconomic characteristics would affect somebody's propensity to use telehealth, maybe for post-acute care, but it's also likely to impact um, whether or not they do get readmitted to a hospital. So if hospital readmissions is one of your outcomes, not accounting for these factors is really going to give you, um, you know, spurious results um, and, and not going to allow you to cleanly evaluate the impact of a telehealth visit. And so we can move on. Uh, next slide. Um, uh, so I'll, I'll quickly talk through uh, randomized control trials here and um, a natural experiment. So obviously the, the value of randomization here is that um, it, it allows uh, these potential confounders that we're worried about um, to be assumed to be evenly distributed in the treatment and control groups when we randomize telehealth or exposure to telehealth. And then therefore, any differences in our outcomes could be attributed to the exposure itself and not to all of these other confounders, all of these other factors. Um, but there are a lot of limitations that I'm sure, um, you know, most of you are all well aware of, um, you know, RCTs can be subject to selection bias as well. Randomization may simply not be practical. It's very costly, very time intensive um, and, you know, uh, it can at times, uh, you know, not necessarily be ethical. Um, and then one of the biggest limitations is that RCTs obviously suffer from limited external validity. So the findings from the RCT are not likely to be very generalizable to a broader population or to different contexts outside of that experiment. Um, and then I will, uh, let's go on to ne the next slide. Um, so I'll talk through some natural experiment study designs, one of which um, I think, you know, Ativ had introduced as well. Um, so we think about ways to leverage existing variation that subjects individuals to as if randomization, because typically we're not able to do an RCT in all of these different contexts. Um, so what's been, uh, you know, one of the uh, sources of natural variation that's been um, commonly used in more recent telehealth research is to leverage differences in insurer policies. So, for instance, you know, we can compare patient outcomes among patients that are enrolled in Medicare Advantage plans versus Medicare fee for service because they were subject to different telehealth benefits that changed over time. Um, the same idea with commercial insurance plans. Um, commercial insur uh, enrollees are um, uh, uh, have access to different types of telehealth or the extent of telehealth would be different for different, uh, you know, people uh, for, for different plans. Um, and then, you know, you could also look across states. So if you're living, uh, so if you examine patients living in states with varying Medicaid and commercial state policies for telehealth coverage, um, for instance, uh, you know, different states have different policies related to payment parity, um, you're able to use certain states as a comparison group in this natural experiment study design. Um, another commonly used uh, source of variation in telehealth research uh, related to what a team was talking about is leveraging clinician or provider organization telehealth adoption. Um, so we could compare patient outcomes among you know, patients that are attributed to high versus low telehealth providers. Um, and that's, you know, relative to all of the providers in your study sample. Um, you could also compare patient outcomes among those uh, among patients with varying exposure to practice level adoption of telehealth. If there is staggered rollout, for instance, um, of a telehealth platform or program. Um, the advantage of all these designs is that they fall under this bucket of intention to treat designs where we're looking at the impact of exposure to telehealth. Um, somebody being assigned, you know, to a high telehealth access group um, and uh, it, it gets rid of and mitigates some of the problems of selection bias. If we were just to look at patient level telehealth use um, and I'll stop there.
Very good. That's a really helpful uh, overview, Gianni. I appreciate that. Um, I just want to kind of touch very briefly on a question. It's another question in my set, but I'm, I'm going to go out of order just a little bit. And it has to do with the idea of when we decide to try to do studies where we're comparing uh, across kind of geographies, maybe across states that have different telehealth policies around uh, coverage or payment parity. You know, what do we need to be careful of as researchers in, in making those comparisons? What are, I mean, we're essentially assuming that, you know, the, the policy is exogenous, right? And that, and that, do we need to worry about that? Or how much do we need to worry about that? Might be a better way to think about that. Annette or Ativ, do you wanna take, want to take that question on? Ativ, go ahead. Yeah, no, I think that um, Jeannie already touched upon it. So uh, while uh, I think state variation in policy has always been something that a lot, it's a great use of research, um, a great thing that researchers have exploited for many and many a study. You did touch upon a couple of the key points. One is what was the trend in those states beforehand? So I don't know. Minnesota was high, you know, have a big increase in spend. Well, let's uh, pretend. Let's say uh, Minnesota's having a great uh, was much lower in its spending growth than other states. Minnesota enters a law, and then you see later on that Minnesota has lower spending. Is that because Minnesota was already on this right trajectory, or was it the law? Um, and that touches upon this sort of related idea, which is why the heck did Minnesota put that law in there? What was going on in the legislature? Sometimes it's a bit random. Some person really thought this was a great idea and they changed the legislature, but otherwise there was something going on in Minnesota that drove the implementation of that law. So I think those are two things that occur to me uh, when I think about with using that kind of exploiting state variation uh, kind of work. Okay. Anyone else? Um, yeah. Go ahead, I Annette. just add that, you know, we also do it trying to compare health systems and maybe in some ways that's trickier because we don't always maybe measure very well some of the key characteristics of health systems that might affect things like things like leadership or culture or ability to change and while there are people who measure that that often isn't the data that we collect and we haven't been very good about thinking about how would you even put that in some of these models very good, very good. Well, I'm going to pivot just a little bit. And, you know, as we think about, you know, I think about kind of policy making and really how, you know, the, the different dimensions on which we care kind of what telehealth's impact might be. And obviously a one of those components or one of those outcomes for which there's a lot of concern is, you know, cost and quality, right? Thinking about value and, you know, we're thinking about, you know, how we define or how we create telehealth policy to enhance value. That's the goal. And we've talked a bit about quality already, which I think, uh, as was described earlier, is uh, the evidence is still a bit mixed, neutral to mixed. Um, and then the other dimension that often we talk about or hear about is cost. And so I'd love to get your thoughts or insights on, you know, when we think about telehealth sub, uh, substituting versus um, kind of complementing in-person care, you know, how do we think about the cost issue with respect to telehealth policy? Maybe we'll start with, uh, um, let's start with Gianni and then we'll go to Atif. Okay, um, I think Debbie, I, the, the second to last slide um, would help to illustrate some of my points. Um, and I'll, I'll just get started. So um, I'll start out by saying, I think that there are a, a multitude of different ways we can think about telehealth impacting um, overall healthcare utilization and spending. So I've just enumerated a few here. Um, of course, it's possible that telehealth is, and a lot of the, you know, the, the literature has shown this already, as I'm showing here that um, telehealth is the availability of telehealth um, uh, uh, causes these services to be additive, inducing more care rather than in placing in person visits. Um, so, as some of this previous work, uh, some of which Ativ has been very involved with, showed that uh, the availability of virtual visits resulted in an over 80% increase in total visits over like an enrollee population. 
Um, that being said, uh, there could be potential longer term decreases in spending if we actually think that access to care is increasing um, such that the unique number of, uh, you know, into patients that are able to access care is increasing and in um, some of the preliminary work we've shown with uh, data from 2021 in the Minnesota APCD, um, the number of unique Medicaid patients um, that are receiving psychotherapy uh, visits is actually increasing, um, whereas we see that the volume of unique Medicare and commercial patients is relatively stable over time, despite there being a, a relatively high conversion of in-person to telemedicine visits. This is still very early, um, but just as suggestive of that. Um, telehealth, of course, can also be complementary, um, particularly for treating and managing chronic conditions, allowing for follow up care, allowing for asynchronous messages with providers. Um, uh, and then we also have to think about the fact that the visit, the telehealth visit itself may lead to higher or lower downstream costs relative to an in person visit, which is a slightly different way of thinking about this than the overall inducement of care. Um, and this just may be that the telehealth visit itself causes a duplication of services or um, is, is low quality and is just not able to resolve the patient's issue. And then finally, um, I know that there are some concerns about overbilling and fraud and um, a recent OIG report did show that um, there were less than 1% of providers that were billing telehealth visits at a high enough rate that it, it posed some risk for fraud. Uh, I'll yeah. stop there. Very good, thank you. Ativ, you want to add to this? I just might make one point, which is that sometimes people um, ask me, like, how does this happen? How does it become additive? Um, and maybe I'll just give an example. Um, I listen to podcasts a lot, and I don't know if others do, but you're constantly bombarded with ads for BetterHelp. And BetterHelp, if you go to their website, will say, we'll help you with conditions such as depression, eating disorders, anxiety, which seems very valuable, but they'll also help you with self-esteem and stress and anger and relationships. And all of those, I, I challenge any of us to find someone who doesn't have a problem with any of those issues. And it just, for me, it always illustrates how this could greatly expand the treatment patient population to, in this case, for better help, 100% of all American adults who are, all of us have some of those issues. And so then it translates into the, the point that you were making before, Jean, is that, okay, if we see this increase in utilization and spending, then we turn to what I think is the more valuable conversation. It's not about whether it increases or decreases spending, but does it improve value and for which patients? So for that patient with depression, maybe that increase, you know, having better help is leading to really better quality of life, better outcomes, that's awesome. But if, if for other patients it's not, then we have to question whether this is a valuable use of our societal resources. So I'm trying to give an uh, example of how it could work as well as to kind of transition to the conversation to value. Very good. And I would just, you know, I would just offer that. I think it, 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 it means that it's actually challenging, right? Because you can't necessarily tailor policy to be targeted enough to meet the populations that are most likely to benefit, but it's possible. It's just that I think we, that's where we hope that research can inform uh, some, some aspects of targeting um, to get a little bit more uh, of a return where possible. All right, so we are getting some questions in and I want to go ahead and make sure we have time because I know as an audience member, uh, you want to be able to get your voice in. So I'm going to go ahead and um, we'll incorporate. They are all in the chat. Um, so it, it looks like we have a couple of questions. We're going to go back to the kind of methodology for just a bit um, to and I'll, this is open to any of the panelists. And so we have a question from Paul Draws who asks. Um, when we think about, um, you know, research, what about patient level propensity for telehealth care? Um, would you also adjust for that indifference and difference? So speaking to estimating a diff and diff uh, design, you know, would you use some sort of propensity um, adjustment in your modeling to help that? Anybody want to take that one up? Sure. Um, so, ideally, in your uh, diff and diff analyses, um, it, you would have two patient groups that are comparable to each other, um, especially in in the way uh, the patient characteristics on average are changing over time. And if that's the case, you really don't need to do 
you know, anything more complicated in terms of propensity score matching or any any other sort of matching to, to, to get the two groups to look alike. And that's one of the benefits of this diff and diff design. It's already baked in. Um, obviously, if that's not the case, then there are some other fixes you would have to do statistically. Great. Thanks, Gianni. Um, we also have a question from uh, Ryan Jelenic that who asks about selection. We're going to keep going back to selection bias. It is it is the big it is one of the big ones uh, in terms of issues. And um, his question pertains to selection bias on the part of the provider as it pertains to study design, because certain providers may only recommend telehealth to patients that they think may be able to complete it. Right. There's an extra layer in there. Um, that we we might want to think about. I would add that there's also patient preference that um, we want to you know capture. Obviously, that's part of the more uh, general conjecture on selection bias. But thinking about the provider level, Ativ, do you want to take that one? Yeah. So I think that uh, the question really touches upon uh, in terms of the modality that's used. It's some combination of the clinician and the patient, and there and so it, uh, it isn't all in one camp. Um, I think the question really highlights for me a policy issue, which is that so much of the policy debate about access to telemedicine is really focused on the digital divide and whether patients themselves have the access to the necessary tools to have a video visit in particular. But in the, some of the research we're doing, a lot of it is driven by the providers. And there are two sources of bias. The first is, unfortunately, in our data, we see that a lot of patient providers who treat patients from uh, uh, disadvantaged populations, we'll just paint a broad brush, are less likely to even have the capacity to do video visits, as well as the bias in who they offer it to. So they have the capacity, but they assume that one patient can't do a video visit, another patient can. And both of those things could be important drivers. So I really think the question really emphasizes to look at both sides of the coin in terms of what's driving the modality that is used. Very good. Thank you, Ativ. Um, I'm going to move to uh, another question in the chat. Uh, is there evidence to speak to the impact of telehealth on patient satisfaction or outcomes um, with respect to allowing for more availability of culturally competent or cultural concordant care when that's an important aspect of care to a given population. Um, Annette, would you want to try to take that one? Um, the truth is there isn't a lot. I mean, maybe if Ativ and Njian disagree, um, but we haven't seen a lot. I mean, we have seen that, as has been mentioned, that telehealth can exacerbate disparities. Um, but I think what's kind of interesting is, is thinking about why it does that. What is it that's pushing that? Is it purely access to technology? Is it cultural? Is it this is where we need the like sociologists and psychologists to get more involved, right? Um, to figure out what the why is behind that, because it isn't good enough to just describe it. And if we don't understand why it's happening, we can't address it. And is the solution to either change telehealth or is the solution to provide telehealth plus something else? you know, a different way of access for people who aren't going to use telehealth for whatever the reason. I mean, this idea that we're going to have like one way of delivering healthcare for everybody is kind of nuts. I would, is almost as good as saying, you know, does telehealth work, right? Um, so that's kind of where, so the answer, the short answer is there isn't as much as we would like. Very good. Gianni or Ativ, anything to add there? Um, I would agree overall on the specific question that was uh, raised uh, about culturally concordant care. I would also just one thing I like to emphasize to people is that um, I also like to challenge the idea that the American public have just loved telemedicine. <laughs> what we see, we have a study coming out in health affairs where we highlight that most patients and physicians, uh, most patients and clinicians were really happy that it was available. They want it to be available in the future. But when we ask physicians, what do you want for the, you know, how much? 80% of physicians say they only want a small share of their visits via telemedicine, and two-thirds of patients would prefer care in person. So they, and they, the number one, I'm sorry, the number one reason they both highlight is the lack of physical exam. And so I, it's just, I just like to just emphasize that I think there are many patients who've appreciated it and many patients who want telemedicine, but if this is, if there isn't this overwhelming love for telemedicine visits that I think I sometimes hear in the, uh, the conversation about telehealth. Yeah, and if I could just add, I think it might be a little more complicated than just the physical exam, even if that's what they say. 
I mean, I think we don't think enough about the impact on providers. And when most people went to medical school or nursing school or school to be a physical therapist, they didn't envision spending their day on Zoom meetings and on screens, right? And and I don't think we've necessarily prepared them for that or we've created a medium that generates the same motivation and dedication to sort of what they view as their vocation. So I, 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 and I think that's a major sort of barrier to expanding telehealth. Yeah, it's a very different model, obviously, and a different, um, you know, different kind of set of expectations on providers that may not bring them as much satisfaction. Uh, but it also may provide a, a new way to kind of expand capacity. So there's kind of trade-offs for everything. Obviously, I think behavioral health may be kind of one special use case where I think the um, remote uh, virtual option obviously has some particular benefits. I want to wrap up today uh, with a final question that I'll pose to each of you. So here we go. If you had the full attention of key state policymakers or decision makers or purchasers, take your choice. Um, what are one to two of the most important messages that you would want to convey about what we know and what we don't know about the current state of telehealth provision? And what would you advocate if you were testifying um, or or consulting? Um, what would you what would you advise them on your best kind of messages or talking points? Maybe we'll start with uh, Gianni. Sure, it's such a big question. Um, so you know, one thing I, I didn't get to talk about um, is, uh, uh, you know, related to the the value of of telehealth, um, and I think it also relates a bit to to Jonathan Newfield's question there. Uh, to what extent can we expect providers being paid fee for service to optimize care? Um, I think one of the unanswered questions is how telehealth is used under these value based payment models. There are some there is some newer evidence that is out that is showing that you know when the provider bears the financial risk in these capitated models or where um, there is downside financial risk, they are using more telehealth where appropriate than fee for service providers. Um, and so there, there needs to be um, you know, more evidence in this area. Um, and, and also, you know, how telehealth, um, how whether or not it should be paid differently than in person visits in different contexts. Um, and so, you know, one of the things that I'm hoping to look more into is um, understanding, you know, whether the quality of telehealth delivered by traditionally in person versus telehealth only organizations is different to the extent that these two telehealth visits should be paid differently because one is more low value than the other. Um, and then in general, I talked a little bit about natural experiments in telehealth today, and I just think that there needs to be more, you know, intentional use of this natural variation in exposure to, to telehealth that would allow us to run these large scale natural experiments. Um, and yeah, and I will end by saying that in the Minnesota APCD, uh, the, the most recent data coming out of, you know, 2022 is showing that telehealth visits, if anything, is increasing uh, slightly uh, over time. So it's it's here to stay. Very good. Thank you, Jenny. Let's go to Annette next. Um, I guess, you know, I'm a researcher and I want research to like change the world, but it's not realistic. And I don't think we can really talk about telehealth um, changing things unless we deal with like the two big elephants that have been in the room from the beginning, which is the restrictions on practice across state lines. You know, like we have Oregon has the same issue you have there in Minnesota. Half of the people um, in Portland actually live in Washington. Um, <laughs> and that was fine when we had relaxation of those, but those restrictions are back. And then the other thing is, you know, broadband. I mean, if we can't make telehealth work without the infrastructure, and that's not just to people's homes, it's to small critical access hospitals. And unless we treat cell coverage like we treat it, that used to treat electricity and water and landlines, we're just, it doesn't matter, to be honest. But I think in terms of what we know, what we don't know is really, we don't have a lot of long-term outcomes for either patients or providers. Most telehealth research is really cross-sectional or single encounter or relatively short groups of encounters. And, and that's kind of a problem because that's a sprint and healthcare is kind of a marathon, right? It's a lifespan thing. And so how do we think about that? And then, but the upside, because I want to be glass half full person, is there's also not much any, you know, it's true we don't have huge benefits, but we also don't have huge harms, right? We aren't finding like that this is 
horrible for a lot of people either. So while we know, you know, the quality of care is important and influenced by how it's delivered, maybe it's not totally dependent on how it's delivered. And if we keep that in mind, maybe that'll make it easier to move forward. Very good. Thank you, Annette. Ativ, I'll give you the last word. <laughs> if um, Well, I'll just try to really be brief because I know we're running out of time, but I, I would just say hang tight. Um, uh, you know, often we criticize healthcare for appropriately being moving too slowly. In the case of telehealth, you could argue we move too quickly, in at least from the research side, that usually changes happen over decades. There's accumulation of what works and what doesn't work. In this case, everything happened overnight, and it is going to take a little bit of time for the research to kind of catch up, as well as the clinical instincts, how people incorporate this into practice, we're still evolving into 2023. So um, I understand why people want that evidence now, but uh, I think we'll see over the next year or two a lot more work coming out that will really help inform some of the questions we've discussed today. Very good. Thank you. I want to thank Ativ, Annette, and Gianni uh, for an excellent session. Uh, lots of wonderful insights and hopefully have the wheels turning of audience members uh, around new research opportunities to think about and um, and hopefully to think about charting the path forward as we try to figure our, out our way to promote high value telehealth. Um, very good. Thank you. And let me turn it back over to Amelia. Thank you so much, Jean. And thanks again to all of our panelists, Ativ, Gianni, and Annette. Um, and thank you, Jean, for moderating the panel. That was a lot of great information that was discussed, and it's been really illuminating to hear um, all of your insights and perspectives on these various different telehealth research questions and challenges and best practices. So thank you all for joining us on the panel today, and it's been such a pleasure to learn from you all. Um, so now we will shift into the session on the Maryland Healthcare Commission's telehealth legislative study. And today we have Alana Knudsen from NORC at the University of Chicago, who will be giving an overview of Maryland's telehealth study. So Alana Knudsen serves as a senior fellow in NORC's public health research department and is the director of the NORC Walsh Center for Rural Health Analysis. Knudsen has over 25 years of experience leading health services research projects and implementing and evaluating public health programs. She has deep expertise in rural health, health equity, public health, health services research, telehealth, and evaluation. Knudsen has conducted numerous health services and health policy studies and public health projects funded by the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, the Health Resources and Services Administration, the U.S. Agency for International Development, and the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, among others. Her project findings have informed state, tribal, and federal health policy. And prior to joining NORC in 2009, Knudsen was the Associate Director for Research at the Center for Rural Health at the University of North Dakota School of Medicine and Health Sciences. Knudsen also has state and national public health ex experience, having worked at the North Dakota Department of Health and for the Association of State and Territorial Health Officials. So, Alana, I will hand things over to you. Great. Well, thank you so much for inviting me to share our experience and to really put a context to what it's like to do some uh, telehealth research for state policymakers. Um, today, I'm going to share with you a study that we completed for the Maryland Healthcare Commission that was included in the Maryland General Assembly's Act, the Preserve Telehealth Act of 2021. Uh, NORC was awarded this contract in the fall of 2021. And if you recall, it was during the uh, December, uh, late November timeframe when Omicron uh, came to the forefront. And that really uh, gave us a chance to pivot our, our research design because we were faced with, uh, again, shuttering of services as well as uh, reducing in-person contact. So let me just share a little bit about uh, what our study included. Next slide, please. Um, the study included five different components, and these components addressed research questions that were related to access, utilization, 
cost and quality. And underlying these questions was also the interest in looking to see how telehealth advanced health equity. So we conducted a literature review. Uh, we originally were going to conduct eight focus groups across the state of Maryland, but again, due to Omicron, we had to pivot and we ended up conducting 78 consumer interviews, eight of which were conducted in Spanish. We also conducted two provider and consumer behavioral health focus groups that really focused on organizational perspectives, uh, both the provider and the consumer side. We also fielded an online provider study that included an online survey with 1,083 participants representing uh, physical health, somatic health, and also behavioral health providers. And we also included a component that examine claims analysis. And one of the questions that was posed to me was what were some of the challenges that you had? Well, in conducting this study, we had to be uh, secondary users of Maryland's data. And because we did not have direct uh, relationships with the um, data for uh, Medicare, we were only able to access Medicare data through 2020. So our data that were used for this study primarily included uh, 2020 Medicare and commercial um, Medicaid and uh, all the other APC data that were included in 2020 and 2021. Next slide, please. Uh, we talked in the last presentation about consumer perspective, and that was really important. The legislature in Maryland is really interested in understanding what do consumers think about telehealth. And what we found was there was a, a big concern about being able to maintain audio only and audio visual technology options. Although our consumers preferred audio visual, there's also a recognition that sometimes audio only is the only technology that works. And again, when we are looking at issues about broadband access, some of our areas in Maryland are just not robust enough to support those audio visual connections. So we also looked at issues in our discussions with uh, consumers. Uh, they raised issues about having no smartphones, tablets, or computers. Uh, they also had limited expertise with technology, and some of them commented about how challenging it was to be able to download some of the apps that they were required to do to be able to facilitate their audiovisual appointments. And some also felt that some of the sensitive topics, particularly in the behavioral health realm, were best discussed using audio only uh, rather than engaging with audiovisual. Um, they also identified a number of advantages to telehealth. And again, what is so challenging sometimes when our policymakers come to us as researchers to ask us questions, these types of questions are not answerable with data that are included in claims. So when we ask consumers about what they felt their advantages to telehealth, uh, they included things like convenience agency in selecting a provider. They could select from across the state. They, especially when it came to health equity, they could engage with a provider who was more uh, culturally aligned with them. And so they were able to uh, uh, be able to have that with uh, telehealth that they could not always have in in-person care because of distance. They also felt that telehealth protected their privacy and they felt more heard by providers. And what I thought was really interesting, one of our consumers uh, really uh, made a, an effort to explain this to us and really framed it in the context that when I go to my provider in person, they sit behind a screen and enter information into an electronic health record. When I'm engaged with them in a telehealth visit, they have to look at me and they are not focused solely on that medical record or their computer in terms of entering data. So they like that perspective. 
They also thought that it reduced access to barriers such as transportation costs, wait times, and distance. And especially for those that had physical mobility, it was also a way that uh, they could overcome that. Now, I think one of the challenges that we um, also had was the policymakers wanted to know how much it saved in cost for our our consumers. But the reality of some of our state budgets and the time frames that we have to conduct these types of research for policymakers uh, do not always lend themselves for us to answer all of these questions. So we were not able to quantify anything in terms of transportation costs uh, saved or wait times saved or the like. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, one of the things that we were also interested was trying to get provider perceptions because again, state policymakers wanted to know how do providers feel about this? How do they feel about using telehealth? And interestingly enough, when we asked about audio only, um, the area that had the least enthusiasm, if you will, for increasing access was with regard to healthcare for patients and clients that had cognitive disabilities. And we saw that our somatic um, health providers uh, were the least um, likely to report that they thought it increased um, access. However, three-fourths of our somatic providers did feel that it did so. Next slide, please. We also ask that same kind of question with regard to audiovisual. And for state policy, I will tell you the issue of audio only or audiovisual is huge. And this is a real issue that they wanted us to be able to discern. And so we asked the same question and uh, basically had uh, the same uh, responses from our providers. Next slide, please. The policymakers in Maryland were also very interested in how much were telehealth services used. And so to get information in this regard, we primarily looked at claims data. But in the next slide, please, uh, we also included a response from our provider survey. So what is not a surprise is that uh, during the pandemic, our urban individuals use telehealth services more than rural individuals. Our younger um, individuals or younger patients and clients also use telehealth services more than older, which is um, akin to what we find in other national uh, uh, data uh, collected during the same time or analyzed during the same time. Um, but our providers told us that patients with limited English language proficiency were less likely to use telehealth services. And again, this is a question that we believe needs to be addressed um, and uh, researched more fully, but with our limited time and resources, we were not able to uh, really be able to understand better um, why, why this was the case. And uh, we recommended for the next round of research, um, especially with regard to addressing health equity and advancing health equity in, in the state of Maryland, that uh, this be a key component. Next slide, please. Uh, we looked at the number of evaluation and management telehealth services, just like all of you do in a lot of your other surveys and, and studies that you conduct. And as you can see um, in ours, we had the highest utilization of Medicaid telehealth services uh, was for our Medicaid. Uh, the dark line represents Medicare claims. And again, we were only able to use Medicare claims through 2020. And the orange line represents our commercial claims. And you can see how uh, the, the trends and the utilization really follow COVID cases. And again, uh, when Omicron came to the forefront in December, uh, you can see how it spiked for Medicare or Medicaid rather. Next slide. Then we looked at the proportion of uh, these same services per month in, in Medicaid and again uh, in commercial and in Medicare claims. And uh, of course we saw um, the spike coming up again uh, during Omicron. Uh, next slide. And 
the state of Maryland is particularly interested in comparing somatic care with behavioral health care. So we split out that data so they could better see. And as you can see in somatic care, um, we had an initial spike when the pandemic uh, first um, started and services were shuttered for in-person and then it leveled off. However, you can see that for behavioral health, we see a, a much different pattern. And again, the state legislature is very interested in better understanding how these different types of services are delivered and how we are able to provide access to these uh, these services for in many areas in our state um, have been underserved for many years. Next slide, please. Cost of telehealth. Um, again, um, cost, when you ask uh, consumers, sometimes it's like beauty, it's in the eye of the beholder. And one of the things that we had asked was about costs attributed to convenience. And for our consumers, of course, the number one issue was no transportation costs. And like many of you, we have uh, very rural areas in our state. And so traveling to tertiary providers and the like, or other uh, behavioral health providers, for example, uh, really can be limiting factor for access to care. Uh, we also found that people participated from home and liked that experiences, and they thought it was really great when providers waived co-pays. And one of the questions that our state legislature is really interested in discerning is what happens to telehealth once co-pays come back. Um, we did learn from our uh, discussions with consumers that they were able to maintain their preventive care and uh, they were able to avoid urgent care in emergency departments um, and that also helped them eliminate some of those co-pays. Um, a couple of examples were specific to being able to use telehealth in a crisis situation for behavioral health where in the past they would have to transport a person but in a couple of different instances that were explained to us, uh, they were able to uh, de-escalate a situation that uh, resulted in that person not needing um, emergency department care. Uh, one of the things that was a real challenge for the consumers in Maryland was their uncertainty about coverage and reimbursement. Um, and also because some telehealth services required an in-person follow-up visit, uh, they felt that it sometimes could be either a waste of time or also um, increase their out-of-pocket costs. So th that was a concern that they raised as well as the potential negative consequences of delaying their care. Next slide, please. Um, the behavioral health focus groups were really interesting, and this wasn't originally in our scope of work, but the behavioral health um, uh, stakeholders in our state uh, were very concerned about access to care and what might change during this 2023 legislative session if their voice was not heard. So we ended up having uh, two additional focus groups, uh, one primarily comprised of behavioral health providers and the organizations that represent them, and the second group that uh, represented behavioral health clients. And we learned a number of different things. And, and as I said, um, uh, telehealth can provide immediate access during a mental health crisis. Um, they also said it reduces no-show rates and potentially reduces hospitalizations. However, we did not have the data to be able to substantiate that. And uh, we believe that um, if we wait for a couple of more years to be able to um, have more data, we are be, we'll be able to do a much more rigorous analysis to really understand, um, do these anecdotal comments um, hold up when we actually look at the data? Um, there was also a very strong recommendation that payment and coverage payment uh, parity for telehealth 
be included as part of the state legislature's uh, next foray into legislation for telehealth. And they also wanted to ensure that audio only and audio visual telehealth visits required um, the same provider effort and fixed costs. So they believed they should be reimbursed at the same rate. And so uh, again, we did not have um, any data to be able to compare. And, and one of the things that was a challenge for us, and hopefully this is going to get better as we go forward, but it was really difficult for us to discern in the data the difference between audio only and audio visual. We could not make that comparison whatsoever in the commercial data or the Medicaid data, and we could only start making that um, uh, we could look and make some of those comparisons uh, toward the end of 2020 data for Medicare. Now, the issue that has been uh, also problematic for us in looking at the claims data was the claims data did not have adequate race and ethnicity included as completed variables on the commercial and the Medicaid claims data. And so we were not able to uh, look at that aspect of utilization. Of course, we had the race and ethnicity on the Medicare fee-for-service data, but um, that uh, was not complete enough for us to be able to really look at it through a health equity lens. We were able to make some comparisons between rural and urban. As you know, um, rural is also part of that health equity piece. But in order to look for future data, we really need to improve uh, race and ethnicity. And, and sometimes I feel like we're at Groundhog's Day because I went to my first uh, telehealth meeting, policy meeting in 1995. And we were talking about claims data at that time. And I, I'm from North Dakota and we were trying to better understand if in fact we saw differences between the use of telehealth um, between our um, patients who were American Indian versus those who um, were white. That was the two major uh, races in North Dakota. And we didn't have good enough data to be able to, the variables weren't good enough on our claims data to be able to make those comparisons. And now in 2023, we still are looking at our commercial data, 70% of the claims were missing race and ethnicity. So, you know, we really need to continue to work at improving our claims data if we are truly gonna be able to provide the kind of robust analysis that is needed by our state policymakers to be very thoughtful in enacting policy. Uh, next slide, please. We also were interested in trying to understand what are some of the barriers to telehealth access. And our, uh, our behavioral health providers indicated that their greatest barrier was low commercial reimbursement, which is uh, not a surprise, but there was also some barriers noted for some of our um, somatic providers as well. Um, that uh, again pertain to uh, low reimbursements. And, and this gets to be problematic uh, going forward because if there's not adequate reimbursement, um, obviously these services will not be offered. Next slide, please. So in the conclusions that we made in our report, um, overall, consumers and providers valued the option of including audio only and audio visual technologies to complement uh, in person care, uh, not replace um, as a complement. Also, the behavioral focus groups were very committed to ensuring that there would be payment parity for audio only and audio visual telehealth visits. And as researchers, we believed that it was really important to have additional claims data analysis to really determine if telehealth services were cost effective, what the quality of those services were, and what role did they play in advancing health equity. And I'm going to turn now to the next slide to show you what recommendations the Maryland Healthcare Commission then made 
as a re result of our study findings. And they recommended to continue the use of telehealth by healthcare providers, uh, at least for these next two years. Um, again, to allow audio only and audio visual. Um, audio only, of course, would be in circumstances where audio visual was not supported or where it uh, uh, was not available. And also to require healthcare providers, obviously, to use uh, technology that complies with privacy and security. Next slide. Uh, these recommendations, by the way, the numbering um, aligns with the numbers that are in the report. And so patient monitoring, uh, using telehealth for hospice services, allowing hospital inpatient and nursing home settings to use telehealth uh, was part of the recommendations going forward. Uh, next slide. And ultimately, based on our study and everything we found from consumers to providers to claims, we really felt it was important to have another 24 months before any final decisions were made. We just did not believe that there was enough data in the claims that we were able to analyze for this study to be able to make uh, good policy decisions at this point. And uh, one of the things that was also not included in the study, and I know you all talked about this in the previous panel, was this issue of uh, clinicians across borders. So the whole issue of licensing and credentialing of uh, providers is also um, on the Maryland General Assembly uh, policy list. Uh, next slide, please. I'm going to leave you with a couple of resources as well. Uh, next slide. Our team published uh, uh, this report um, on behalf of CMS that examined rural telehealth during the public health emergency, and we compared rural and urban use of telehealth. And one of the things that we found that was an interesting finding was that states with the highest telehealth use pre-COVID became low telehealth users during COVID, while low telehealth users pre-COVID then became high telehealth users during COVID. And my home state of North Dakota was actually the highest, as proportionally, was the highest use of telehealth pre-COVID. And that really reflects from a Medicare, and again, this is all based on Medicare fee-for-service, that really reflects that under pre-COVID telehealth reimbursement, that the distance site was the uh, specialty site, or was that specialty physician, and the originating site was one of those rural designated sites, such as a rural health clinic, a rural FQHC, or a rural critical access hospital or rural PPS. And so um, it, there was just a real change. And we did some follow-up qualitative interviews with some different uh, providers. And one of the things we learned was uh, to, again, the point that was made in the previous presentation, there is a lot of uh, provider preference that also goes into using telehealth. And for some of these states that were high users, they're more sparsely populated. The older adults that, of course, used telehealth pre-COVID went to a site and did not have the uh, did not have the responsibility of having to uh, make that home connection. The connection was made at a provider, that originating site. So um, having broadband in their home or having expertise in being able to use uh, digital technologies was not a requirement. And so one of the things that uh, one of the providers told us was that uh, because of the way COVID spread, um, a lot of rural communities in the central part of the country that had been high users of telehealth pre-COVID, um, they, they did not um, have the same kind of experience and did not stay away from, um, they did not shelter at home in the same way. Um, providers also did not always feel comfortable using uh, telehealth technology because a lot of those providers in those uh, rural and frontier areas are 
older providers that are not as familiar with the technology. So again, additional research needs to be conducted to better understand that usability, um, not only for the patient, but also for the providers. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, just real quickly, um, I, I need to make sure that all of you are aware of the Rural Health Information Hub. Um, if you have any questions regarding anything related to rural health in terms of policy or finance or uh, different ways that uh, programs have been implemented in rural communities, um, the Rural Health Information Hub is funded by the Federal Office of Rural Health Policy. It is your one-stop all things rural health and uh, human services, and you have an opportunity to pose questions and uh, get responses uh, usually within 24 to 48 hours. This is a service that is free to you, and I highly recommend that you check out some of the resources. Uh, this is a telehealth toolkit that our team created uh, for the RHI Hub. Uh, next slide. These toolkits are all designed in modular format to meet people uh, and particularly uh, rural communities and providers where they are at in either exploring an issue or implementing, evaluating, or looking at how to sustain it. Uh, the, the models um, always include examples in the program clearinghouse of actual programs that work in rural communities. Next slide, please. And these are the um, different toolkits that are available. Um, to date, these toolkits have had over 11 million um, page views. And um, again, they are intended for use at the rural community and provider um, area. Next slide. If you have any questions, please contact me. I think we are a tad bit over. Awesome. Thank you so much, Alana. It is so interesting and insightful to learn about what's happening in Maryland and in general, it's helpful to hear from other states that have also conducted or are working on conducting a telehealth study. So thank you so much for joining us today and for sharing about your work in this space. Okay, so we are coming towards the end of the workshop and now we will have Jonathan Neufeld from the Great Plains Telehealth Resource and Assistance Center, or GP Track, provides some closing remarks. Um, so, Jonathan Neufeld is program director of GP Track, which is a federally funded technical assistance program housed at the University of Minnesota. Dr. Neufeld has, con has consulted on a wide range of projects related to rural health and telehealth over the past 15 years. He has presented at regional and national conferences and published peer-reviewed articles in the fields of telemedicine, clinical decision support tools, mental health services evaluation, and clinical outcomes. Dr. Neufeld was formerly the Vice President of Information Technology and Integrated Care at Oaklawn Psychiatric Center in Goshen, Indiana. In this role, he oversaw the IT programs and services at Oaklawn as well as leading a team of clinicians providing mental and behavioral health services in primary care settings across Elkhart and St. Joseph counties. Dr. Neufeld received his PhD in clinical psychology from Ohio University and completed a postdoctoral fellowship in integrated primary care in the Department of Family and Community Medicine at UC Davis Medical Center in Sacramento, California. Before moving to Indiana, Dr. Neufeld was an assistant clinical professor of psychology in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences at UC Davis Medical Center and senior research associate at the UC Davis Center for Healthcare Policy and Research. There, he collaborated on a wide range of clinical and research projects in the field of mental health, primary care, telemedicine, and healthcare technology. So, Jonathan, I will hand it over to you. Thanks, Amelia. All right. So, uh, because of that way too long introduction which, that, which, that I supplied, my, home, my own fault, sorry, uh, we're going to move into some comments. I am hoping that I can add some, some value here. Um, uh, I don't know if any of you remember this. Um, there was a game show on a while back, and one of the prizes was you got to stand in a phone booth with wind swirling all around and $100 bills in the wind just flying around. And you got 60 seconds and you got to grab as many $100 bills as you could. That's a little bit like 
how this conference has felt to me in trying to figure out what am I going to say after these fantastic presentations? How am I going to make this uh, helpful or wrap this up in any way? So I'm going to make I'm going to give it my best shot and try not to look too wind blown while I do it. Um, I provided some slides ahead of time. I just want to focus on one slide 64. If you could put slide 64 up and I'll just use it to to kind of start out uh, making some comments here. Um, and the main thing, the main point that I want to make with this slide is that there are multiple levels of analysis that we can talk about when we're talking about telehealth, right? We can talk about is this individual telehealth call of high quality? Is this is this the way we want it to be? Was this individual patient served well with telehealth, right? And we can move on up to the clinic or the site. Is this clinic or site or this population um, being served properly? And all the way up to is this state, Minnesota or Maryland or any other, being served well by the telehealth programs that are being reimbursed in such and such a way within the state. And and I know that's obvious. Those levels of analysis are obvious. But the questions that we ask and the kinds of data we need and even the ways that we formulate um, our answers, they subtly vary at the various levels. And then if you put all of this in the context of regulation, what can we accomplish with regulation and reimbursement policy? Uh, it, it, it underscores the point that I think a number of our uh, presenters have made about how telehealth is just so diverse. Um, for one, I know Annette made this and maybe some others uh, made this point, but maybe some others, telehealth can mean many things. And we we need to move, and I agree with this, I think she said and in, uh, that we need to move uh, maybe past whether it's effective or not and start to ask about how it's being implemented. What are the models that are being used? Um, I think uh, Dr. Marotra said the same thing uh, about ways that uh, uh, telehealth varies from, you know, provider to provider, clinic to clinic, uh, patient to patient, and population to population. Um, and I think that in some sense, uh, what, what this implies to me also is that telehealth, um, uh, telehealth providers will innovate if given the chance. And we don't wanna, we don't wanna you know, regulate away all innovation because that's part of what we're trying to do here is get better at what we're doing. When I first started, best practice, and I'm a uh, psychologist, when I first started in telehealth, best practice is we don't see patients who are suicidal because we can't intervene physically. Well, over the years, that changed, and folks came on and said, you know what, you're not going to see a patient for, you know, months or years, and then as soon as they express some suicidality, say, okay, sorry, I'm out of here, can't help you. I mean, that's not providing the kind of support that we could provide, and sure enough, there were providers that innovated in that space to specifically address support needs in suicidality, as well as a number of others. We also didn't want to treat uh, uh, patients with severe mental illness. Uh, and eventually programs said, you know what, we can figure out how to do that. And they did that. So we have to be really careful to, to um, allow for that in, in the ways that we approach this and the kinds of findings that we, that we seek. I think one important, really important distinction that uh, Gianni, you made is the difference between telehealth only providers and traditional providers who are doing telehealth. And we all had to do a bunch of telehealth, but um, those two, I mean, and it's a very broad brush um, as Ativ would say, but those two groups are very different in the way they're using telehealth. And I think that matters in a, in a number of ways. Um, I think Ativ also said, as well as Annette, something about equity. And uh, my questions, or I, I wonder to what extent, and, and, and he's right, it, it, telehealth um, gets used inequitably. But, and I've made this point before to some folks, that a train runs on the tracks it has. And if our Tell if our um, uh, broadband infrastructure and our indeed our healthcare infrastructure, if these two rails are both fundamentally inequitably distributed across the country, telehealth is not going to fix that. It is reliant. It is a train running on those tracks, and so we have to find ways to to address inequity at the at the railroad level, not the train running on them level, or at least realize that it's a system that we're trying to impact. Um, 
I think also related to that is the idea that that both that the behaviors of both patients and providers evolve. We hope that they will evolve. And so the, the telehealth that we're studying today is not the telehealth we're going to be doing tomorrow or the day after or the year after. We are trying to change behavior and become better at delivering care and become, we have to realize, better at receiving care as patients, better at accessing care. And so we have to, to focus on, on helping that evolution and not just uh, treating telehealth as if it is and you know a fun uh, a platonic ideal that we study you know like the hardness of granite um i think beyond uh, another point that i thought was really well made are that um and and ativ said this patients and providers don't always want telehealth and i think it speaks to the point that um uh, some 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 findings that we hear in the, among the telehealth resource centers that, is that patient satisfaction is not just they're not satisfied with telehealth or not. What they're satisfied with is, did I get what I needed? And to his point, to Atif's point, during the pandemic, we needed telehealth. And it was very satisfying to get what we needed via telehealth. We needed healthcare, so we needed. And telehealth was a channel to provide that. And so when we get what we need, we're satisfied. When telehealth offers things that we don't need, convenience or access, we. And, we may not be interested in that. We want to go into the office and point to the mole and show the doctor and do the do the whole thing. That's fine. I, I think we can. I think we re just have to recognize that that satisfaction is not a characteristic of telehealth. It's a characteristic of a broader system accessing tools. Um, and so I wonder to that point, um, will the use of telehealth, including both video and audio only to a certain extent, extent Will those be in some ways self-regulating? Now I know those are dangerous words for the regulators on the call, but but I wonder, and I am curious to what extent uh, we heard this a lot in 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 doing technical assistance during the pandemic. That it, as toward the end, more recently, folks are saying, yeah, we do we do audio only, but we don't really like to do it. We do video when we can, and of course we want people to come in when they can. We don't see that being abused again with the distinction between you know telehealth only services, which if that's their business model, that's a different thing. I think Atif's point about Firefly Health was very well taken that um, that there are differences in model that 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 uh, that um, transcend a little bit our ability to conceptualize them in our coding schemes as well as in our regulatory um, schemes and. Uh, I think um, I think that point was made a number of times that we don't always know what exactly is meant by telehealth or what exactly is happening in the encounter between patients and providers. And this is something that we really do need to focus on. Um, comparing Medicaid data from one state and another when they code telehealth differently is just such a challenge. And it doesn't just mean that they use GT here and 95 here. It's things like, you know, audio and video being lumped together, or, you know, these providers bill it this way, but these providers bill it a different way. Um, uh, these providers use a place of service code and these use a modifier. It's, it really, it, it, it makes them um, um, non-comparable and that's a challenge, both for researchers and ultimately for regulators and anybody who has a, a stake in this. Um, I think several people um, made the point that, uh, that we need to we need to uh, improve our game in that regard. Um, a question that I have that that didn't come up, but I really it's always in the back of my mind as I think about this is what what effect, if any, can is there uh, to the context of um, competition in 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 the U.S. healthcare system? Uh, healthcare in the U.S. is a business, and there's always a kind of underlying competitive pressure, and so. When you have organizations, you have researchers saying, you know, how does telehealth make care better or worse? There are also organizations saying, how does telehealth help me increase my market share? Or will I lose market share if I don't do it? And that's a that's an orthogonal set of questions, but it's also super relevant when we're talking about how do we regulate or how do we, uh, you know, put guidelines around telehealth because um, we don't want to uh, inadvertently um, you know, uh, uh, fertilize an invasive species such that the, the good flora and fauna that, that we want to, to foster end up getting choked off. 
And I think that's that's the, the underlying sort of regulatory concern and the, the concern of all of us who want to make healthcare better in one way or another. Um, and finally, uh, a point I want to make uh, or I want to draw out that that Annette made early on, and also Alana uh, and the folks uh, in Maryland. I think uh, we can we can take this from them as well. Um, is that um, maybe there aren't huge harms at risk here? Um, and in fact, I heard this point made by some folks in in a Medicaid department where you know we're actually not even spending a whole lot of money. There's not a lot of money at risk either. These are these are small and not ex they're not growing explosively. These are small expenditures. Maybe we maybe we watch that and see how it develops and maybe we're not um, uh, risking a whole lot of uh, um, of ill ill behavior um, by watching by just uh, and I don't mean just letting it run, but um, by moving slowly and allowing the kinds of innovations that we want to see across the healthcare system, recognizing important things like the fundamentally different motivations of a telehealth only business, for example, and a traditional provider that does some telehealth as well to improve access for their patients and improve the quality of their care and, and what other, other other factors they may be trying to influence. Recognizing all of that, but, but recognizing that ultimately uh, it's there's not there's not an overwhelming amount of risk that we're taking on by allowing that. I think that's I think that's wise counsel, and I think that uh, is important to recognize. Um, to that end, we do another thing that that I don't think was addressed, but possibly could have been. We do need to figure out ways to identify, characterize what the kinds of adverse utilization that we're that we are afraid of what they look like. I think uh, Atif had some slides that I didn't see on, you know, underserved populations. And if there's underserved populations and you and you start uh, reimbursing for telehealth and utilization goes up, is that good? It, it, I mean, is that bad? Is it how much how much should utilization go up when you improve access to care? Um, it's it's unfortunate. I haven't seen anyone quite come up with a way to decide how much healthcare we would have had without telehealth during the pandemic, though we can, I mean, there are obvious ways we could, we could model that, but, but I'm not sure any of us are confident that we could say with any degree of, of, of confidence what it actually was. We know that we used it a lot and we needed it a lot, but we don't know uh, what we would have done without it. Um, so, uh, so focusing on how to detect those adverse events, how to detect the fraud, waste, abuse, the things that we don't want to have happen, the things that we that we uh, are cautious about, um, those are skills we're going to have to develop anyway. And so I hope we can invest some some effort and some uh, some resources into doing that as well, um, uh, as as well as uh, you know spending the time to do to do the empirical research that we can do uh, and foster the innovation that we desperately need uh, to improve uh, access and outcomes and quality and costs across the healthcare system. I hope that in some ways uh, those comments have been helpful. I, I really want to provide in the seconds that I have left some kudos to uh, Minnesota Department of Health for pulling this group together and the folks at the Evidence-Based Policy Center. I mean, this, is, this has just been um, a fantastic experience and uh, one that I've just uh, really appreciated uh, participating in. So with that, I will turn it back to you, Amelia, and, uh, and I'll let you close off the conference. Great. Thank you so much, Jonathan. And thank you again to all the guest speakers who participated in the workshop today. Um, I've learned so much and we really appreciate you all taking the time to lend your expertise today. Um, I just want to note that we will be creating a written summary of this workshop and everything that has been shared and discussed during these sessions today. And the Minnesota Department of Health will make that summary publicly available likely in early April. And we'll also be sure to to share that summary with all the participants who registered for the workshop in a follow up email once it is available. So thank you all for joining us for the workshop today and I hope you all have a great rest of your day. Everyone bye. -bye.